Um, thank you so much for sticking around and uh, be here for the third time in a row. Enjoy the program. We have wonderful presentations and we will be if we can. We'll ask as many questions as we can. I, I do have a couple of quick questions for you. What, last week, what did you think last week of the presenters? Um, yeah. Um, yes, ma'am. They were very, very good. Just too many of them. You know what? We absolutely agree. And you know what it came down to, you guys? We were just trying to bring the best we could in timing because they volunteer the time. So you have to get them when you can get them. And we went from five sessions to four sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think five sessions would be better going forward? Because we could have devoted yeah. a whole session on e-commerce. Yes. Yeah, you could have. Yeah. Would you prefer the five sessions? Anybody else want to second that or have another opinion? Hi there. Glad you could be here. Well, I the only feedback we got on five sessions was it was too many weeks. We used to have seven even. We yeah. cut it down to five and now it's four. <coughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, this today is a critical part. The ninety nine percent of the people that call me first want to know about money. <laughs> and I always tell money should be the last thing you think about, you know, but Eddie might disagree with me. But we're going to go ahead and start the program. You've had Eddie before, so Eddie, you're on. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming back. Now, as you have noticed, every session is built to give you a piece of the puzzle. International trade globalization is really a puzzle. If you miss one piece, get guaranteed you will not get paid. If you don't do your marketing research, you will not be able to start. If you don't have a marketing plan, you will not be expert ready. If you are expert ready, but you decide, I just want to sell, good luck getting paid. <laughs> Sometimes you do your credit due diligence, you sell, you export, everything went good, a war happens in that country, you will not get paid. But if you had credit insurance, guaranteed you get 90 to 95% of that transaction. So when we think of international trade, you have to think of the whole picture. And it has to be scenario planning. Today is peaceful. What happens if there is an epidemic? Look at China, the coronavirus. <laughs> it's affecting the economy right now in China, and it will be affecting the US economy, guaranteed. If there is more luck down in China, there will be more effect. We export from Malaysia and Thailand, and it's already affecting us. Exactly. Yeah. It's affecting Japan, Korea, China, everywhere. The longer it continues, and it will, it seems, is going to be affecting world economy. Already the virus has spread into more than 25 countries. I get to report daily from the Chinese Council, and they have a newsletter that they sent to me. As of yesterday, 60,000 cases, 1,100 of 1,300 now dead. So every day that passes, there is more death, more cases, and they don't even know the extent of the virus and how it's spreading and so forth. That affects international trade. So if you are going to sell to a country, you are going to ask many questions. What is the environmental, economic, political, socio-cultural, et cetera, et cetera? And I'll teach you all the techniques. You have to be a strategist. That's why it is a challenge. A small business de decides, I just want to sell because everybody is selling on e-commerce. Fine, you can do that. But then do you know that even with e-commerce, there are regulations? People think I can take cryptocurrency. The IRS now is getting into the game. Notice in your return this year, there is a question, have you used any digital currency? They want to know, yes or no, because now there are tax implications for cryptocurrencies. People thought, we'll start with cryptocurrency to evade. <laughs> no, 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 the IRS says, no way, you're not going to evade. Now they're going to be clamping down. If you are using cryptocurrency, your chances of being audited is very high, they say. They're going to be auditing businesses that use any digital currency, because they're trying to evade taxations, they think. Please move your car. The license plate is 7DKV263. The owner of a black Nissan Ultima, please move your car. That is an interruption, and this is a good example. 
Sometimes you'll be selling internationally, and all of a sudden you get an alert like this. <laughs> you, know, you might be getting, be careful. Something is happening. Something is about to happen. So that's why I named my session International Trade Finance, Getting Paid, Balancing the Risk Between Seller and Buyer. And when I think of seller and buyer, I don't just think about the individual or the individual company. You have to think in terms of the countries. Because there is a simple formula. Before you decide to do business with a company or a person, you ask the question, is the country sanctioned or not? Just imagine, if the country is sanctioned, it doesn't matter if the customer is AAA credit. You cannot do business with Cuba, for example, or North Korea, or with, with Iran and so forth, unless you have special dispensation from Treasury, Department of Commerce, Department of Defense. You have to have a special license. But once a country is sanctioned, you cannot do business. That's the C of compliance. Remember the word cash starts with a C. Customer starts with a C. Compliance it starts with a C. Don't think about cash. The first thing you want to think about compliance. Can I comply with rules and regulations before I sell to a particular company or a customer or a country? There are many lists. There are almost 11 lists by the Department of Defense, Treasury, Department of Commerce, the entity list, the debart list, etc. If your customer that you are selling to, their CEO is on that list, you might not be able to do business with that. In fact, there are cases. We travel the world, right? Do you know we cannot stay at a hotel that is owned by somebody on one of these lists? But how many of us travel to a country and decide, let me see who owns this hotel? <laughs> if it's government owned or owned by somebody who is a drug lord or a terrorist or whatever. But if we ever get audited, we might be non-compliant with rules and regulations. But let's face it, the government does not have the enforcement capability to find every individual who travel around the world to see where did you stay. That gives you a little taste of international trade. Because if you want to get paid, you have to be fully compliant with rules and regulations. In fact, an ex-diplomat to India, a US diplomat said, international trade is not for the faint-hearted. <laughs> because there will be risks, guaranteed. Just the coronavirus is the last. Uh, the, uh, the, the really novel, they call the novel coronavirus, is a new threat to uh, globalization and trade at this moment. So I want to start with a movie to show you. How many of you have seen the movie Gravity? Good. Now, I want to get you some feel of what international trade could. It's not there. Now try to feel her feeling and not think that you are not just in outer space, you are doing. Thank you. 
how do you feel after watching this clip? What emotions do you have? Last year, that was me at least 10 times a day. Exactly. Now I'm, now I'm immune to it. I just go, okay. <laughs> Open another notebook. No, notebook. Exactly. Because I love the name of this movie, Gravity. Because what happens when you get a sales order or a uh, an inquiry or a request from a customer? It attracts you. <laughs> See, there is a kind of gravity towards the sale, towards making things happen. And it's breathtaking. You see how it starts the movie with beautiful scene of the Earth, the blueness. This is one of the most beautiful planets. Yeah. From high up, it's a beautiful planet. So you are gravitated towards it. I want the deal. I want the beauty of the deal. It's so breathtaking. But have you thought of possible risks? Notice what you heard later, a mission abort, mission abort. Sometimes we are so attached to the transaction that we don't want to abort the transaction. In negotiation, there is a rule. No deal is better than a bad deal. <laughs> so sometimes you have to say no to a transaction. No matter how much attraction, gravitational forces that deal will have towards you, you have to say no to that transaction. Because look at the roller coaster feelings. I love the music. You can feel your heart beat. You said 10 times your heart was beating. Sometimes you cannot go to sleep because thinking, oh my God, I sold. I sent my product. How do I get paid? Because the name of the game is not just selling. It's about cash flow. A sale is not a sale until the cash is in the bank. Really, it's, it's a gift. If you sell your product and you didn't get, you gifted that. You are not in the business of gift giving, are you? <laughs> Otherwise, do it if you just want to give gifts to people. Now, I want to show you another clip of a movie. Have you seen Captain Phillips? Yeah. This is very interesting because let's close this one. Can you hear me? 
I wonder why I show this clip. In fact, I recommend that you go and watch the first 10 minutes of the movie because this is a trailer. But the movie starts in a peaceful surroundings, in the home of Captain Phillips. You think, wow, what a peaceful place. And then on the way to the airport with his wife, they are having a beautiful conversation. But they are talking how the things are happening too fast. And today, even somebody, if you want to find a job, you'll have 50 people trying to find what position, or 1,000 to try to find what position. I'm just paraphrasing. This is not the exact wording. But as he's going to the airport, you feel life is good. But towards the beginning, there are some things that he was checking, making sure he had a passport. Uh, the captain log was checked, routinely checked, and so forth. Which means, before you have a transaction, have you checked the conditions of that transaction? the economic condition in that country, the political environment and situation. But then, as he goes to the airport and bids his wife uh, goodbye, it's a security alert. Even when you enter the airport today, you have security alerts. That means, have you checked the security alerts on your transaction that you're going to be safe and secure? Once you sell, you're going to get paid? But unbeknown to him, in Somalia, this is their business. They're pirates. They have to make money. So they decide, they start in, in that village by the seashore, preparing to go and hijack a freighter. But it's funny that when he calls it, oh, maybe just, it's a fishing boat. And he says, no, it's not. <laughs> and then the think of your transaction being hijacked by a possible prospect or a so-called customer in your mind, and then they hold you for ransom. I've known people that shipped into Egypt to other countries, and then once the freight arrives in country, the customer says, by the way, I don't want to accept it. Give me an extra 50% discount. Because you know, you already shipped. Once it arrives, there is demerge fees. There are other penalties. To try to bring it back is very expensive. And a lot of people say, okay, fine, I'll give you 50% or just leave it. I don't want it. Because it's going to cost you more to bring it back. So they'll hijack your transaction. Your profits will be decimated they will be eliminated completely. So that's what international trade is all about. Think of the consequences. Don't just look at the breathtaking view of the transaction. Don't look at the dollar sign. Look at compliance. Look at risk. Look at cash flow that is going to be secure and protected. That's why in international trade, I'll share with you a formula, H to the power three. H to harness the power of international trade. You see, I'm not against international trade. I'm a proponent of international trade. It's a beautiful thing. Only if you know how to harness its power. Because power could be positive, could be negative. It could explode in your face, or it could help you with nuclear energy. Harvesting the benefits. What you are, you are learning is to harvest the benefits of international trade and halting the risks. There is no reward without risk. If you want to make money, there are risks involved in that making money. In fact, dealing with globalization, the first rule, dealing with change. <coughs> Business changes every second. We are here in this room. I don't know what's happening around the world. But I make it my business. Before I, I leave the house or start my business, I listen to world news. Before I go to bed, I listen to world news. Because I want to know what's going to happen, what is happening, and what is happening before I go to bed. Because guaranteed, in these seven, eight hours while, while, while I was sleeping, like that movie, while you were sleeping, many things have happened. Today, an hour could make a difference. In the past, take this epidemic with China. Through the Silk Road will take months before anything passes. The virus has died. There will be no expansion of that virus. But because today, you cannot go to a country without seeing Chinese tourists. I went on a cruise last year. Imagine in the heart of Norway, in Oslo, in the capital of Norway. Guess who owns several of the souvenir shops today? I was there many years ago. I didn't see Chinese owners. Today, you see more Chinese owning places around the world than ever before. Just look at the Inland Empire. In Cucamonga, I bought my house in 1999. Very few Chinese. Today, there is a whole section that is owned by Chinese. I love to go eat my sushi. I go get it at the Chinese market. 
imagine Japanese sushi, but I buy it at the, at the Chinese market. Very important to see they're everywhere. So that means a virus that originated in China, because people are fanning across the globe, they are taking that virus with them unbeknown to them. <coughs> so that's why international trade is about risk. That's why understanding the route, route, route means way, R, risk. O of opportunity, couch in uncertainty, threats. What's the antidote is exploration. You see what international trade is all about? In order for us to seek the O of opportunity, we are going to understand the risk. There will be uncertainties. There will be threats on a daily basis. But what do we need to do to eliminate the threat, eliminate the uncertainty, and minimize or reduce the risk? Explore the options. E of education, educate yourselves. Being in the ETA program, it's a form of education and exploration. You are looking at the possibilities, the alternatives. You are creating your own firewall, so to speak, a protection for that deal. How do you do that? You have to think as a strategist. You have to understand the power of due diligence, strategic assessment. You have to determine, not, not the transaction, determine the country the nature of the environment in that country, the environmental influences, building what I call the CMCS 1 and 2. I used to do that for, my, for Rainbird, which is the credit manager's country scorecard and customer scorecard, and understanding the options for each. Due diligence. Today you are going to learn that before you even sell, you have to understand, do you have, if you are a big company, start with your salesperson who is on the ground, or your sales agent in that country. Or if you are a sole owner, have you gone to that country? Have you explored the transaction? You put on the sales hat. You call your bank. Do you know that banks have economists on staff? They have economic reports. You want to get an economic report in that country before you sell into that country. Understand what is happening. Your broker, because you are going to need credit insurance. Ask your insurance broker. They have access to country reports. Your insurance company is another one, because brokers work for insurance companies. So what do they have on that country? Credit reports. Before you sell, get a credit report on that particular company. You can buy, for example, a gold key from the Department of Commerce, and it includes a credit report on that particular company. Country rating reports. Before you sell into a country, you want to know, is the country good country to sell into? Is it a triple A, double A, one, or, or it's a triple B or triple B minus, or a C country, or a D country? FCIB, this is an association for finance credit and international business executives. They have reports on international. The Hans Belzac report, the, economic, the Economist Intelligence Unit. In fact, do you know that US Embassy State Department, they have what they call country desks? Call them. Ask them, what do they see in that particular country? CITD offices in the state of California, the Centers for International Trade Development, colleges and universities, the web, the news, and ultimately personal visits. You know your best source of information are taxi drivers whenever you travel. Not economists, taxi drivers. Why? Because they are in the streets daily. They are your sensors. What is happening? Where is really? The hot deals and the cold deals. When you talk to taxi drivers, they are great observers. They are great sources of information. This is just a partial list of what you need to do before you sell. Guaranteed, most of you don't do that. And you must say, Eddie, this is very overwhelming. Yes and no. You don't have to do everything on this list, but know that they do exist. And when you need it, you are going to invoke that option. Many years ago, I never even thought of this. When I started in credit management 30 plus years ago, I never thought of fraudulent transaction. I thought that the world was honest, that the world is good. You get a transaction, you sell. Now we add one question. Is the trans Notice before even doing anything, the first thing you do when you get a request for a quote, a request for, for a sales order and so forth, is the transaction fraudulent or legitimate? <laughs> we are living now in the age of e-commerce. Anyone could be sending you something. 
is it really legitimate? Will you get paid? In fact, I had a client in the Midwest. They sell Dell and HP products. You'll be surprised how many fraudulent transactions they received. And guess from which country? Can somebody tell me the name of the country that they got fraudulent transactions from? USA. Pardon? USA. Not USA. There are some, but the biggest number, what do you think? Pardon? China. Not China. It starts with a C, though. No. Go north of, of the United States. Germany? Canada. <laughs> well, you would think Canada is great. But we found out most of the fraudulent transactions that they got were from Canadian companies. Not Nigeria. We got things from Nigeria. We got things from the UK. So I decided in the credit policy, the first thing we do before we ship, is the transaction fraudulent or legitimate? That came from real life. I was working with that company, and they got defrauded many times. And we found out for small things, things that are mobile, like laptops. So we found out now, if you get an order for more than three laptops, question mark, <laughs> like 25, 10, 15, they turn out to be all mostly fraudulent because people want numbers, quick, something to move very fast. So then in your company, don't be gravitating towards the breathtaking view of that transaction. The first firewall is this question. Is that transaction legitimate or fraudulent? Well, just out of curiosity, is there something in the Canadian law that allows that particular purchase or transaction to be hijacked, like you were explaining? Where are they receiving the, the actual product and then not paying for it? How is it fraudulent? They receive the product from you, they send you a check, and the cashier check was not, it was fake. In fact, the lady couriered, and also women, that was amazing, because you think, she's, she's sending me the check, she's the CEO of the company. Turn out, don't be snowed by gender, don't be snowed because it's Canada. Regardless of gender, regardless of country, of reputation of the country, always be objective. That's the key. Never be subjective. Never attach emotions to anything when it comes to international law and international trade. Just say, is it fraudulent? Is it legitimate? Now, how do I discern that? We'll talk about that later. Another thing you want to do, notice we have not even talked about the customer. First, we want to make sure that, now let's assume it's a legitimate transaction, that there is a real company standing behind that transaction. What's the next thing I need to ask? What are you exporting? Where are you exporting? Who will receive your item? What will your item be used for? This comes from the US government. This is export control questions. Because where are you exporting? The country could be sanctioned. Therefore, you cannot do business. Where are you? What are you exporting? The product could be dual, commercial and it could be used for military and terroristing reasons. So the what for your product, the where to the country. And who? Ah, the person could be on one of the lists. That's why if you get a credit report, chances are the credit reporting agency is doing all of that for you because it costs money to understand compliance. You're not going to do it. And even they recommend, you check it today, you say, great, everything is good. They say, you check it today. If it took three, four weeks to prepare the transaction to, for shipment, check it again, because things could have changed from day one to day 30 or to day 40. You have to be constantly checking the transaction. And then, what will your item be used for? Think about it. You sell a product to somebody in the Netherlands. Legitimate. Now, what if that Netherlands company, the Dutch company, is selling it to a terrorist organization? European law is different than the US law. Or if that person wants to, do, wants to sell it to Libya at one point, Libya was sanctioned. I had a client at that time when, when Gaddafi and his regime was sanctioned. They sold their product to the Netherlands. The Dutch company shipped it to Libya. Immediately we contacted the State Department and said, what do we do? As a, as a, a US exporting company, you need to inform the authorities that you discovered that your product is going there. Now, how do you protect yourself against that? 
because you cannot be the policeman on every company, every transaction. On your credit application or on your acknowledgement of an order, you put, is this going to be re-exported? Who is the ultimate user? If the company, company is the ultimate user, then we go to question three, who will receive my product and they are going to be using it. But if they say, yes, we are going to be re-exporting, we ask to which countries? <laughs> then you protect yourself. It's really, I want to be compliant, but I'm not the policeman of the world. So remember the what, if there is a dual purpose, the where, the country, their sanctions are not, the who, the person receiving, and the ultimate use. So you see, we haven't even started selling that transaction. Now you say, Eddie, this is too overwhelming. I cannot do all of that. Guess what? A lot of people don't do that. All it takes being caught. You get caught one time, you lose your export license. There is a book, don't let, don't let this happen to you. CEOs of companies, officers of companies got penalized hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars with jail penalties. It's a fine. You take the chance to be fine. But if you do your due diligence from the beginning and you are compliant, you don't have to worry about any of these fines. But these questions are not really optional. This is part of compliance. So the first question, is it legitimate or is it fraudulent? These are four questions that you need to ask. Now we go into the transaction and the person. Now I put on my credit analyst and credit uh, uh, professional hat. The first thing I will ask, credit focus. Can I approve this transaction? How do I approve a transaction? Two things have to be present, ability and willingness. The customer who buys the product has to be willing to pay you and able to pay you. Shakespeare said, words pay no debt. If a company said, come, Eddie, sell me your product. I love your product. I, I will pay you. I will? <laughs> no. That's, I am willing to pay you. I am able to pay you, and I will. Great. What if a customer, for example, is able to pay you but unwilling? Ha, huh, that's where you work the deal, you protect the transaction. For example, if I tell the customer I want financial reports from them to assess the credit worthiness of the transaction and they refuse to give me financial information, does it mean I cannot sell? No, it means I can go to a credit re uh, a reporting agency, get a report on them, then I go to an insurance, credit insurance outfit and say, do you have something on this company? Yes, we do, they are great. Give me an insurance policy so I can ship to them. Then I can turn that unwilling customer who is able to pay me into a good transaction. Because if they want my product, but they are unwilling to give me financials, but they are able to pay for it, but now there is a third party, such as Exim Bank and others, that are willing to give me an insurance policy to sell, I'm in good hands. What about those willing but unable to pay today? In the long run, they will be able to pay, but not in the short run. For example, a company that wants a million dollars, but they can only pay 30,000 a month. 30,000 times 12 doesn't come up to a million dollars. But if you get a trade finance deal with Exim backing over five years, now you, they can afford to pay you that million dollar, including the interest over five years. So these are the things that you have to think about. So then I look at think outside the box, seek trade finance alternatives. And what if the customer neither able nor willing to pay me? Reject the applicant. <laughs> so you see, that's why you cannot overstep. This is really not an optional piece. You have to go through this matrix of credit focus. Now, bankers and credit professionals, before they make a credit decision, they subject that decision to what I call the seize of credit. In international trade, there are 22 Cs. <laughs> In domestic credit, there are 18 Cs. But I want to highlight the key Cs here, character. Think about it. Think of a transaction as a person. What is the reputation of that company, their character? You want to be doing business with people that when things get tough, they are going to be behind their decision and they are going to pay you no matter what. Capacity. I call that the income statement test. Do they have the capacity, the ability to generate the sales and the profit with which they can pay you? Capital, I call that the balance sheet test. That means, do they have the assets and the liabilities with the residual that they have an owner's equity that they can pay you? Do they have the cash in the current asset section of the balance sheet with which to pay for the transaction? Collateral. 
a company of good reputation, capacity and capital, they have the collateral. They can put PG, uh, personal guarantees, corporate guarantees. They can give you a CD of deposit, etc. They can give you a guarantee to the transaction. Conditions, which means you have to look at the industry conditions and, uh, and also at the country condition, economically, business conditions. Computers, which means technological state. You cannot be do do business with a company that's still in the stone age. Are they with the technology today? See, these are basic C's. And then I will go down to common sense, which means what's your gut feeling? Shall I do business with this company or not? And guess what? The HeartMath Institute tells us when you say this is a gut feeling, do you know that we think with our stomach too and we feel with our brains? <laughs> Our stomach is linked with thousands of sensors to our brain. When somebody says, I have an intuition, I have a gut feeling, there is a cognitive process going on. So don't overlook that, that feeling, that butterfly in the stomach to say, hmm, yes, it's still breathtaking. I feel gravitated towards that deal. But remember, Captain Phillips, there is someone there that's going to hijack that profit, hijack that transaction, and hold you for ransom. So, Common sense. Don't overlook common sense. That is really into domestic. But then in international, we inject the sea of country risk, currency risk, cultural risk, and, they, and I add the sea of coverage, which is insurance. What is country risk? <coughs> when you look at countries today, anything from their economic, political, sociocultural, technological, the laws and regulations in that country come to bear in any transaction. We were selling into Brazil in 1997. You know what happened in 1997 in Brazil? The Riach devaluated heavily. Currency risk came into play. Overnight, Argentina, do you know you'll go to Argentina in that time? One US dollar used to be 99 centavos. Well, that means I'm cheaper than them. Then overnight, one dollar was 3.42 pesos to the dollar. Look at that. If you sold $100,000 to that customer, you came 342000 In 1997 in Brazil, in the morning, the real is one dollar to 119. Overnight, one dollar to 240. What's happening here? I sold you $100,000. You need 119,000 real. Now you need to over 200 and some thousand real. Your customer cannot come up with this money if they already sold that transaction locally. So that's where currency risk is going to come into play. And then cultural risk. We, we looked at that last week. Practically, that's another big piece of the puzzle. If you don't know how to communicate, how to connect on the cultural sphere, you're not going to get paid in a timely manner. You might not even be getting paid at all. But there is one C that is beautiful coverage. Have an insurance policy to, to protect your portfolio and that transaction. A case in point, one of my clients in Oklahoma sold into Vietnam. Thankfully, we had an Exim Bank policy. The transaction was $100,000. My customer says, great, Exim gave me up to $100,000. The order came to, to $102,000 plus. They said, no worries. We'll sell 102,000. That was the first mistake. You never go above the, the, the limit of the policy. 100,000 insured, you sell 100,000. The other 2,000 will be outside the insurance. All of a sudden, the Vietnamese company defaulted. <laughs> and Exim Bank was decommissioned for a few months. But luckily, we sold the transaction before their charter ran out. And then we were hoping that after that, they will come back into commission, so then we can put the claims. We had to wait the 240 days of waiting period. We put the claim, and guess what? My client got paid $95,000 on that 102. 2,000 some they lost. The loss was 5,000. They lost 7,000 on 102,000 transaction. But their margin was huge. Therefore, they made money. If they didn't have that Exim Bank policy, they will be out $102,000 period. Zero. So that's the C. If you want to think internationally, have you thought of insurance coverage? And today, Exim Bank will be in the room, and they can discuss more about that importance. 
Now, let's think, you want to do business with a country, assess the nature of the environment, audit the environmental influences. Every day you need to ask the question, I call that the continuum of risk. When I worked at Rainbow Corporation, when a salesperson says, Eddie, I want to sell into Costa Rica, I want to sell into China, I want to sell into Peru, I want to sell into Dubai and so forth, the first question I'll ask on this continuum, is the country stable or unstable? Is the economic situation certain or uncertain? Is the environment static or is it changing daily? Is it simple to do business there or is it complex? A good example here, we are in the United States. Where is it simple to do business, in China or in the United States? In the United States. The United States. If I put the United States, I can say, simple to do. China, very complex. Most of the African countries, very complex. So you have to ask that. And then, once you ask these questions, you audited the environment, now you go deeper. Peel that onion. What are the pest analysis? In England, they call it the pestle analysis. They add legal and environmental, but we can include that into the pest. What are the political factors? It adds legal and environmental because government decides on regulations for, law, for, for rules and regulation and for uh, the environment. So the economic factors, what is happening in that country economically? Sociocultural factors. Think about it. I always say, when you look at China, I don't look at the politi politics or the economy. I look at the sociocultural factors. If anything were to affect China, will be the demographics. Look, with the epidemic, that's part of socioculture. <laughs> you are dealing with people. Because China has 56 ethnic minorities. If one of them goes out of control, the others will follow suit. There will be some kind of coup in that country. India, look at the sociocultural. Because you have, these two countries command over 40% of the population. Look at Egypt. What down Mubarak in Egypt? The young population, 84% unemployment. And Facebook, when you combine Facebook and 84% unemployment, the government was out. So today, to me, I always look at sociocultural because people need employment. <laughs> if you cannot give the young people work, and today with gig economy, God help us. Because it's only a matter of time before people, look what's happening in Chile. Chile was one of the most, after Pinochet became very nice and peaceful. We are not hearing that on the news every Friday, every weekend. Like what's happening in Hong Kong, there have been demonstrations in Santiago, Chile. Because of equity issues. Thanks to the internet, people can see, oh, America and the West are doing fantastic, but we are poor in this country. Oh, the rich are doing great, but what about us? The 1% owes everything, but the 90% owes nothing. Sooner or later, these will come back to haunt us. So when we are engaged in international trade, think of those issues. Because have credit insurance before you sell into that country. <laughs> Protect that transaction. Because overnight, China has proven. Hong Kong, who thought Hong Kong can be demonstrating week after week after week and, and really challenging the dragon? It never happened before. They would have been squashed by now. The army would have gone in, but because of China and international business that they are doing, they are trying to keep the West at peace because they want the business. Technological factors, you cannot ignore. Today we have logistic chains, technology, blockchain, now it's part of that technology. So technology is very important. <laughs> I mentioned the credit manager country scorecard, and this is how I build it. In fact, I'm sharing a tool that I use with my clients and I use myself as a credit professional and trade financing manager. There are 10 blocks understand the environment for the country. Then you ask the question, what is the political, economic, sociocultural, technological state in that country? Then you assess the banking and FDI. You know what's FDI? Foreign direct investment. You know why is that important? Many years ago, you would hear 60 billion went to China and only four or five billion went to India. Now it tells you where the world is looking to do business. Therefore, you start looking towards China. Now, notice the Chinese have invested heavily in Africa. I was surprised. I was visiting a friend in, in Zambia in 2009. Do you know in Lusaka, Zambia, there is a Chinese casino? And as we're taking the bus to go down to Victoria Falls, 
I couldn't believe my eyes in, because the copper belt, Chinese lettering everywhere. China is buying the raw material and resources of Africa. They are now commanding governments in Africa because they go in, they are building roads, they are building airports, they are building sea ports, and so forth. This has been happening while the United States was asleep at the wheel. And you don't realize that until you travel to those countries and see the depth of the Chinese investment into that continent. You know why? A lot of economists say Africa will be the next player. On purpose, they're keeping that giant dormant. <laughs> They were now taking care of China, taking care now India, but ultimately a lot of investment will be going into the African continent. Look at country rating and IMF standing. Listen to the news, listen to the locals. Seek input from the Foreign Commercial Service, the UZACs, United States Expert Assistance Centers, State and Commerce Department. And ultimately, what is your company strategy and appetite for risk? So you see, these are the 10 blocks of the I call it the credit manager country scorecard. What about the customer scorecard? The first block is the, the seas of credit that we discussed. There will be a subjective, objective, and a mix factors in that. Then avoid the bad seas of credit. Competition, complacency, and carelessness. When a salesperson comes to you and said, oh, boss, I got this transaction from China. My competition is selling into China. I want this to be sold into China. That, I don't care what the competition does. They could lead you into a minefield. Your competition might have the resources, the connection, the relationship that makes the transaction very successful, but you might not be able to do the same. So you, you, you study the competition, you do a SWOT analysis on the competition, but you decide based on your company strategy and your intent and your cash flow realities, your banking requirements, and so forth. What about carelessness? A credit manager will say to a salesperson, they need to sign this application and fill it out. Eddie, don't worry about it. They will sign it. No. <laughs> Once I ship, they're not going to sign my credit application and the guarantees. You cannot be careless. You cannot even be complacent. Eddie, but this company paid. If they paid last year, it doesn't mean they'll pay today. Look at Eastman Kodak, how many years in business they went out. Wonder Bread, Hostess. A lot of companies that were in business for 150 years, 100 years, they went out of business. So you cannot be complacent. Credit and cash flow cannot afford complacency, carelessness, and following the competition. Security instruments and guarantees. Many times you are afraid, like if you are doing business with Mexico, by all means, add a pagare, a promissory note. Some people say, but as an American company, I'm afraid to do that. Guess what? Pagares are like water in business there. Everybody uses pagares in Mexico. Add them to your portfolio. You want this transaction? Add a pagare. Financing <coughs> options. Sometimes your customer is good, but they don't have the immediate cash flow. Think of trade financing options, and Exim Bank has some alternatives. SBA can help you with that also. And credit insurance. Exim Bank has a credit insurance, and also you have a host of private insurance too. So you see, this is what I call the credit manager customer scorecard. Vital considerations. Company plans, strategic intent, the competitive forces, your business realities, and the country environment. Now you see how, if you want to get paid, you have to have thought of all these elements. I can guarantee you many in this room have never thought that there is a process like this. By show of hands, how many of you knew about a process like this that a company goes through? Yeah, very few. Yeah. I used to do all of it. What you see here, this is not a fantasy list. I did every single thing that is on this list when I worked for the Rainbow Corporation because I couldn't afford to lose one dollar. I'm one of those people. If I sold, I want to get paid. <laughs> I do have a question. Um, um, culturally, some countries are averse to signing contracts or mm -hmm. having contracts. Unlike here in the U.S., where everything is the contract mm -hmm. and fine print. Um, I think, for example, like China, uh, 
or some places in the Middle East, it's a handshake. It's a, I like you, you like me, and, you know, we'll get around to it kind of thing. Can, can you kind of get into that, especially with China? Excellent question. They do business off an email, like. You could do that, but you also need to know the, the company that sold you that email, that sent you the email, the company that contacted you. Because if a Chinese company sends you an email, the first question I'll ask, is this a legitimate or fraudulent email? No, it's, if you send them a, a, a quote, yeah. you know, a, a request for quote, and they send you their website and everything, and then they're willing <laughs> to start doing business right away. Send me the money, I send you the product. Oh, that's different. You're talking about you're dealing with a vendor here. You want to buy their product. That's a different relationship. But also, if you want to buy a product, you want to make sure that they exist. Correct. That's what I'm saying. I will also do Why my due I diligence. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if, you know. That's where due diligence is key. Right now, in credit management, we are using the same technique for vendor compliance and vendor due diligence. Everything I did this, I will do it on the buyer. But now, also, we use the same techniques. We get a credit report. The first thing I will do, let's say, if you want to buy a product from a company in China that is wholly owned by Chinese, the first thing I do, I will ask the question, do they really exist? Are they a legitimate company? I'll try to get a credit report. I'll, I'll call the foreign commercial service. Maybe they heard of this company or not. I'll go on the web. I Google the company. I'll put their name in the news. Like one of my clients in Oklahoma called me and says, Eddie, we're getting this order from, uh, from uh, Nigeria. We were Googling. We found that the order was not legitimate. It was a small home garage. Then we got another order from Kenya. And the guy told us, I am in the industrial zone. Immediately what we did, we went to Google Earth and beamed down to that location and found that there is a chicken restaurant near it. We sent the email and said, great, can you tell me how, what's the chicken menu in that restaurant? If you are legitimate, you can walk across or you can eat there and you tell me what the chicken menu. They couldn't. We didn't sell to them. <laughs> See, today, thanks to Google Earth, you can actually locate a company, understand if they are doing business from a garage or like they got an order even from the U.S. We put Google Earth and we found out that it was a garage. We saw a car and we said, oh, you are presenting yourself as a company, but with buildings, that's not a company with building. That's an address of a garage in Kansas. <laughs> so in essence, that you could not have never done years ago. But now with Google, you can do that. So whether you are dealing with a vendor or whether you are dealing with a customer, due diligence is key. You cannot sacrifice due diligence. Now, culturally, if a company says, you know what, I do business on handshake. I lived in the Middle East. My word is my contract. I understand that. But before I accept your word, I want to know that your word is your oath, that you are legitimate, you are a gentleman, you are a lady behind it. You're, if you tell me something, you are going to do it. I will get a credit report. I will check your name all over. Like, for example, we got another transaction from Africa for this client. And on the credit application, they named officers. I Googled every name of the officer. And I found out several of them were under corruption indictment in their countries. I'm not going to do business with people with, with corruption indictments, even though if they are the chairman of a company or not. And at one point, there was the minister of that country. <laughs> so imagine, ministerial power, big deal. You see, character is not position. Reputation is not position. I could be the, the president of a company, but it doesn't mean I'm of full moral character. I could be a pauper in the street with a flea market, but I could be of excellent character. So that's the sea of credit, character. So that's why, when it comes to credit, it's mysterious. That's why I love it. Really, there is a lot of sensory experience. There is common <laughs> sense that comes into play. There is intuition that comes into play, as well as the figure. That's why a credit decision is not scientifically. It's an art. We say it's the art of credit management and partly the science of credit management. Why? Because there are facts, figures, but there's also intuition and interpretation. Take a balance sheet. I can window dress my company. Assumptions produce numbers. Assumptions are not fact. We assume things that's not factual. Therefore, a lot of figures in a balance sheet is going to be built on assumption. In the income statement, going to be built. That's reality. I sold X, but I can change some of the figures. I can change the tax implications. So when I look at it, even as a financial analyst, there's a lot of interpretation. That's why we say gap versus gap. 
generally accepted accounting principle versus games accountants play. <laughs> so you say gap versus gap. So that's why when it comes to credit analysis and financial analysis, you have to understand what appears to the eye might not be the truth. Very good question. So again, this is where the art comes in, understanding culture, understand how they do contract, how they decide. But here I'm giving you the formula for success. Now, you want to, to get paid. In fact, if you go to trade.gov, and then in the search bar you put trade finance guide. We tried to download it, but the firewall in this building will not allow us to download the PDF. But you can actually, on your phones, download trade.gov, then get the trade finance guide. There is an English and Spanish version. Download the English version, because going to go into detail into this pyramid. Because when you are selling, there are terms of sale. We call them credit terms, and sometimes we call them the sales terms. You get a transaction. Let me help you to do business in this way. Remember, when you think of the word contractual obligation in business, think of a marriage. You don't go to the streets and find the first person said, that's my future mate. You don't just get an email and say, great, I want to sell. Because you don't know someone, everything starts with cash in advance. The first transaction, second, third, fourth transaction, I recommend. If after you have realized it's, it's legitimate and you haven't violated the four questions, the country, the product, the duality, all of that, they say, great, let's get acquainted. Let's start with cash in advance. Now, as you get acquainted, you say, I like this customer. They bought, they paid. They bought, they paid. They bought, they paid. Now, there is one caution. Bust outs happen this way. Sell you an order for 1000 I pay you 1000 5,000, I'll pay you 5,000. 10,000, I'll pay you 10,000. And then I hit you for 50,000. And then good luck, they disappeared. You see, again, it's the art of credit management. So I have to think, is this a bust out situation? Are, going, are they really snowing me, paying for a few weeks or a few months? Especially if they want to do it very quickly. You don't build, remember, you don't get married overnight. So in essence, you do, let's get to know. You, instead of saying, now great, cash in advance, then after that we say, special international trade, let's invoke the banks. Let's have now intermediaries, matchmakers to help us to understand one another. Like you have today eHarmony and so forth. So they get your profile, that profile, they start to match you. Now, Mr. Customer, you want a million dollars, you want $100,000, I will accept a letter of credit. The first one will be letter of credit at sight. I don't give any terms. And we get acquainted more. Now we go letters of credit with terms. 10 days, 15 days, one month, two months. I was able to go up to two years. Banks will give you 180 days. Then you can extend it and extend it. If the bank wants to give that uh, client more, I'll do LC discounting for me, as if I sold on cash, so to speak. That we call that usance letters of credit. That means there is a term. Now, but remember, letters of credit cost money. If you go to a bank, you try to open a letter of credit, it costs money for the seller, it costs money for the buyer. But we are now courting, the relation is good. Now we say, fine, let's get engaged. Now forget the letter of credit, we want to save money, I trust you enough, we'll do what we call documentary collection. Instead of opening a letter of credit, I will send the paperwork through a bank in that country. So it protects the process. And ultimately, we say, let's get married, open account. See, now, as you build the trust and the faith in the relationship, now I'm fully exposed, practically. An open account, you are fully exposed. I, so I sold you, now I'm at your mercy if you want to pay me. So that's what happens. So this pyramid is very important. I've seen a lot of companies, they want the transaction so bad, they start with an open account. If you want to be there, by all means, get credit insurance. Go to Exim Bank. If you are a small business, get a policy for that transaction or for your portfolio. Because if Exim Bank says, we know that country, we know that customer, we feel good, and they give you that policy, fine. And guess what? An Exim Bank policy doesn't cost you anything if you think as a business. A customer wants it. 
You call XM, XM says it's going to be X amount of points on the transaction included in your margin. Practically, the customer will pay for the insurance policy, not you. You protected yourself, and many times I used to tell clients, you know what, let's invoke an insurance uh, option. Yes, you are going to pay for it, or let's invoke an LC. You will pay for the discounting, because when we do that, I guarantee the transaction, because if you default, I'm cutting the credit line. But if we continue working together and get paid, I will keep that line for you. In the Middle East, for example, a lot, I, I dealt a lot at Rainbird with open accounts. Every open account was guaranteed by a standby letter of credit. And we will get it every year renewed. Because the Middle East is a very dangerous area. A war could happen. Look at the Gulf region. Look at Iran, Saudi Arabia, the drone attacks, what's happening today. You don't want to be fully exposed. Even Dubai. Dubai is a great country. I've been there five times. Beautiful place. Even Dubai, all our distributors there, we had standby letter of credit on all of them. Why? Because Iran is a threat in that region from the, from the 60s and 70s till today. That threat has never disappeared. If anything, it will be increased. So get in that country a standby to guarantee the open account. Now, remember your question? When we talked about credit notice, doing business in a particular country with a new prospect, the first thing, understand the region, understand the culture, understand their core values, the role requirements. Then we go to understanding the country, then we go to understanding the, con uh, the customer. So we go from the general to the particular. So this is really the pattern on international trade. If you want to do business, you start from the stage, the macro stage. Like if I want to do business with China, I won't start with China. I'll start with Asia. That is the bigger state. The region is Asia. Then the spotlight goes into the culture in that region and then the culture into that country. Because first understand the regional. Because when you think of China, think of North Korea. There are relationships. If North Korea does something to the US, China will be involved. <laughs> so. South Korea will be involved. That's why you have to look at the region first, the culture influences, the requirements for the region, and now you go into the specific country in that region. After that, you go into your customer in that country. So from general to particular, region, country, prospect, customer. When you think of cultures, there are three kinds of culture, active, linear active, multi-active, and reactive. Linear active. The US, all the Anglos we have, one, two, three, four, five. Multi-active, these are the Hispanics. They multitask, they get too many interruptions. Reactive, these are Asian culture, China, Japan. You don't even see their facial expression. Sometimes you are in a room negotiating and you can never read. They take in the information and they react. So that's very important. So they are reactive cultures. Framework, tools, continuum of risk we discussed, the pest analysis, the credit manager country scorecard, the credit manager customer scorecard, the matrix of ability and willingness, and the seize of credit. These are your tools in credit management in guaranteeing that you are going to get paid for the transactions you, that you are going to be using. Then we went into knowing the prospect, the customer. Again, the ability willingness matrix and the seize of credit. Look at the doing business in the world. If you were to, to do business in, with a Fortune 100, 500 companies or big companies, even medium size, the first thing they'll ask, you have to sign a credit application. Then get a credit report. Then I'm going to do financial analysis. Determine the documentations needed, especially international. If I'm shipping a product from the US to Canada is one set of documentation. If I ship the same product from the US to, uh, to Mexico, there might be a different, might be the same because of USMC, but there will be always differentiators. Case in point, when I worked at Trainberg, I can easily send an invoice to all of our US distributors. The invoice is a legal document. I can go to court with that invoice. When we opened Rainbird Mexico, our attorney said, guess what? Your invoice alone is not a legal document because you have to add two things to that invoice. That invoice has to become like a pagare promissory note, a section where they sign, and there should be another section says, 
acknowledgement of receipt of goods in good order. I said, why is that? He says, then when we go to court, the judge will say, okay, I see the invoices undisputed. There is a pagare in that invoice, and there is acknowledgement that the goods were received in good order. Then there will be no dispute in the Mexican courts. Then it goes to what they call the executive path, the express path for litigation versus the ordinary path that could take years. And once you get a judgment, good luck to enforce that judgment even. When we open Rainbow Australia, our attorney said, yeah, the way you do business in America is one thing, but in Australia we don't add an indemnity agreement to, to shoulder all the credit lines that Rainbow is issuing to its distributors. In Mexico, our attorney said we need to have solicitude, the linea de credito, not only solicitude the credito, but also for the credit line because it will, uh, it will help us in court. I have my credit application signed, but also I have another application for the line of credit issued to that Mexican company, evidenced by a pagare behind it. <laughs> so while in America, I can sign an application, I can send you the invoice, a statement, and then you have to pay me. When we did Rainbow Dubai, things changed. So in essence, when you are doing business, understand the documentation. What one country requires is not what the other. Take security instruments and guarantees. I, when I used to work at Rainbow, I bought a book. Many years ago, I paid $195 just samples of pagares throughout Latin America. Like a pagare in Venezuela is not the same as in Mexico. It's not the same as in Peru. It's not the same as Costa Rica. And that attorney did a beautiful job. He went to all these countries and took samples of pagares. So right now, it's preferable. If you are doing business in Mexico, make sure it's not an English pagare, a Spanish Pagare and Mexico Pagare. Maybe ask your, your distributor or your customer, go get me a Pagare from Mexico. Let me look at it, but make sure that you know what every word in that Pagare. Have one in English, word for word, what the Spanish reads, so you can compare uh, the translation. Make sure that your intent is there. Everything you want to be in, uh, in that Pagare is there. But think about it. A Mexican judge looks at Mexican Pagare templates, while a Venezuelan judge looks at Venezuelan templates. So in essence, if you want to do business in Venezuela, have a Venezuelan template pagare, not a Mexican one. So that's very important about documentation and security instruments. Deciding on the credit limit. How much will I give that customer? What terms do I need to give the customer? Is it net 30, net 15, net 60? In Canada and the US, 30 days are great. It's the, the norm. You go to Mexico, they say, oh, no, no, 30 is not enough. We need 60. No. I had a rule, North America, Canada, Mexico, and, and the US, 30 days for my distributors. Now, it stands the reason, if I want to send a shipment to Brazil, on the ocean, it's going to take 45 days before it arrives, or maybe, then I will give them 60 days. I might even give them 90 days. So you, there are many factors that go into how, what type of credit limit and terms I should give to a customer. There are logistic issues that go into that. But remember, the pyramid. Always start with CIA, cash in advance. And remember, cash in advance is not a check. Because a cash in advance is when money is in your account. A check is not money in your account. A cashier's check could be fraudulent. I've had a cashier's check that was not a cashier's check. So be careful even with cashier's check, if they might not be real. Even green bucks, $100 bills, might not be real. A good example. I was in, in Santiago, Chile one time. I took my wife. With Rainbird, my visa was for five years, so I didn't have a problem. I needed to buy a visa for my wife. So I whipped $100 that I took at Chase Bank. So I give it to, to the lady there. She says, sorry, I cannot accept that $100 bill. And I said, I got it from back. It doesn't matter. It's mm -hmm. AF series. I said, what did, does it mean? Drug money. I said, but this is not drug money. It came from the U.S., from my bank. I will not accept that. So okay, no problem. I took another $100. I don't accept that. Luckily, I had a third one. Oh, yeah, that is okay. Here it is. Legal tender. $100 bill. I came back to the U.S. I was able to go to my bank, and I spent them. It was accepted in the United States, but was not accepted in Santiago, Chile, because mm -hmm. she had a list, because a lot of Colombian drug lords were using those types of series, AF series and so forth. Wow. Can you imagine if I didn't have a credit card at that time because I was ready to give her my credit card if she said no to the third one? That tells you, even dollar bills might not be real. 
I went to the bank the other day to California Bank and Trust. So I gave uh, my wife gave her to deposit. She put those dollar bills into the uh, their machine, and it keeps pushing the five dollar bill out. I said, "What's that? The machine cannot read it." But luckily, said, "No worries. I will." And that's all. But can you imagine if that was fifty or hundred dollar bill? The machine cannot read it. What do you do? So even cash. Cash is when that money is wired to your bank account and the bank says, now, free and clear, you can use that money. So that's <laughs> when I think of cash in advance. And then explore coverage, credit insurance, and explore trade financing. Now the permit. In fact, we don't need to go through that because when you download, why don't we do this test? On some of your phones, put, can you Google trade.gov? I want to see if some of you can get this. because. We tried to show you the, this tool, but if you go to trade.gov, let's make a little exercise here. Is anybody there? Tell me when you get to trade.gov. If you are there, in the search line, put trade finance guide. Anybody got there? You got there? Now, there should be two versions, English version and Spanish version. Can you see the English version? It's not there? No. Let's go to Google and see where we can get that. Yeah, Google Trade Finance Guide. Trade Finance Guide. Anybody was able to get that on their phones? No. Yeah, because here it looks like firewalls were strong. They couldn't. Were you able to? No. But if you go there, there will be two versions. Did you get? You got it? Yeah. Then you need what? The English version. I got the English version. OK, you said the export put in the search line, trade finance guide. Okay. Yeah. Right here? Yeah, no, here it says inside the, uh, the website. Oh, inside yeah, the website. Yeah, go back to the, to the link. Well, here we go. Now I've lost it. I'm, I'll find it. Okay, but if you find it, what thi one thing you are going to find, there will be two pages on each, up, like cash in advance. First, you are going to find a page that talks about risk between seller and buyer, between open account and cash in advance. Think about it. When I sell on cash in advance, I'm the seller, fully secured. I get the money before I ship. The buyer, fully exposed. They send me the money before they get my product. But if I turn tables, I gave them an open account, I'm now fully exposed. I send my product, it's a gift to them, and now all of a sudden, if I don't get paid, I, uh, I lost that sale. So now I'm at the mercy of the customer paying me. So the customer is secure, but I'm fully exposed. So it's a continuum. Now risk to seller versus risk to buyer. It's up to you to decide. But I mentioned, I always started at Trainbird with cash in advance until I felt secure with the customer, then little by little opened the spigot and took them to open account. These are some of the slides that you will find in the book. But one thing I want to talk about, when it comes to commercial letter of credit, there are two kinds, a letter of credit or a standby letter of credit. A standby is when you have an open account. The standby will cover it. Just in case you don't get paid, the standby will come into play. Otherwise, a commercial will be transactional. These are some of the benefits. So in that booklet, everything that you see here is in the booklet. Uh, that's why I just wanted to show you. Now, if you have an open account, how do you immunize your open account? Imagine if you sell somebody a $100,000 product on open account, make sure that you have a personal guarantee or a corporate guarantee. Like if you are selling to a corporation, make sure that their, their board seals a guarantee for you. They put their stamp of approval on that guarantee for you. And in Canada especially, if you have a personal guarantee, you have to renew it every year. I used to send it to all my clients that I have guarantees. And especially if the wife is added to that guarantee, make sure that you have both signature of husband and wife on that guarantee. And then bank guarantee in a form of LC or standby. Promissory notes and pegarays, 
and ultimately credit insurance is what I tell people to do all the time, get the credit insurance to immunize the uh, open account. Now the payment method of risk. Choosing a payment method requires finding the right balance between seller and uh, buyer risk. For every method that we talked about, there is a cost, whether letter of credit, documentary collection, even an open account, there is a cost to you as the seller. Because what if your bank says, your borrowing base is going to be uh, by, by your receivable, but no receivable should exceed 89 days. At 90 days, you become ineligible. Now, it costs you. You will not be able to get some cash flow. So be careful what are your covenants with your bank when you give terms. U.S. companies generally don't offer the longer terms requested by buyers. Why? Because we are cash and carry in a sense. Trust in God, but all others pay cash. <laughs> so that's very important. And then learning about payment methods, now understanding the different risks for the different methods will help you to be more adaptable in international trade. Now, in some countries there will be no options whatsoever. There are no local options, Exim Bank is not open, credit insurance is not open. Try to sell to Zimbabwe today. Credit insurance does not give you Zimbabwe. Some countries in the world will not even be insured. Take North Korea, good luck, you're not going to be able to do business. Local options. If you are selling into a country, many times we think in terms of U.S. terms. You'll be surprised, in some countries they have better terms than us. I was visiting a, a client in Ecuador, I found out my client was able to get 48 months with the Ecuadorian bank while Rainbird couldn't give them 30-day terms. So we invoked the local option. They went to the bank, got 48 months, 48 months of, uh, of, uh, of line. They bought the, the system complete from Rainbird Cash in advance. So sometimes look at the local options. Sometimes in countries, the interest rate in that country is cheaper than us. You use that country's interest rate versus us. So there's a lot of things in international trade that you need to look at. Exim Bank. Exim Bank is here, so they will be talking about that. Very interesting option. Everything you see on the, in this slide, I used it. I love using the Exim Bank option, whether it's the insurance or the trade finance. But I want to give you a secret formula if you want to deal with, uh, with Exim. You have to have these players, a buyer, a seller, a broker, a lender, and uh, uh, an Exim Bank as insurer. If, if, if you don't have a broker, you are at a disadvantage. You can't go straight with Exim Bank. Don't try to do it directly. Get a broker. You don't pay the broker anything. They get paid uh, from Exim. Exim takes care of the broker for you, or the lender takes care of the broker for you. You just let them do the matchmaking for you. By using a broker, they are very experienced. So the, I found out at Rainbird, we tried to do it ourselves. Oh, why even deal with a broker? But we don't pay them. We start dealing with the broker. The broker took us to the lender. The lender said, Exim doesn't give the money. The lender gives the money. So now you build relationship with the lender. The lender knows you. They are more comfortable with you. Now they can easily communicate with Exim. When you have all these five players, really, in the transaction, your, your success factor will be higher. SBA is another option for you, and SBA will be here to tell you about their, uh, their, their approach. Credit insurance, again, invoke it as you can. Now, when it comes to credit insurance, remember, you might be dealing with, com with COFAS, for example, they have agents. Others might have brokers. Others might have, then you deal with insurer, the insured. Exim is a player. Single policy versus multi-policy, cancellable versus non-cancellable, and discretionary credit limit and ledger experience. All these are terminologies you need to know when you come to understand uh, uh, credit insurance. Then other things, you will see that in the booklet, trade.gov, uh, trade finance guide. They talk about consignments, export factoring, export working capital, government assisted programs, and so forth. I can tell you this is one of the nicest tools that I, that I have. They, they have it in Spanish, they have it in English. Practically, how do we harvest the benefits? Educate yourself, build alliances with banks, partner up with finance companies, institutions, work closely with your brokers and ECAs, which is the export credit agencies. Know what's out there. Sometimes Export Development Canada could help and so forth if you have a, a Canadian content versus and U.S. content. Harvesting the benefits, 
if you, if you understand all these payment mechanisms, understand the risk between seller and buyer, you are going to increase your export, you are going to protect against risk, increase ability to obtain financing. I have a client who has an insurance policy on their trade receivables, they are getting a better percentage from their bank on their accounts receivable because they are insured by Exim Bank. Customer goodwill and loyalty, now you can give your customers better, better terms when you have a credit insurance or you understand the risk. Meeting or exceeding the competition and ultimately you increase your market share. Remember, when you are dealing with the world, there are metaphors that you cannot escape. The serpent and the eagle. Practically, you have to be as cautious as the serpent, as far-sighted as the eagle. You also need to understand the fox and the hedgehogs. A fox knows many things about many things, not little things about many things. In my opinion today, if you're going to be a fox, you have to know many things about many things, but a hedgehog knows everything there is about one thing or two things or three things. Be an expert, depth and breadth, the, the scope into your industry, into your product and services, but then understand that the whole world has many things around you. And remember the sword of Damocles. There is always a sword hanging by a horse's hair. At any moment, if that hair is cut, that sword will come down to cut the profits of international trade. Every transaction has a sword of Damocles hanging above it. And remember the route. You want to take the opportunity? There are risks, uncertainties, and threats. Explore the possibilities and the alternatives. And I included some of the uh, resources that you want to go into and the presentation will be available on the website, right, Veselina? Then there are these links, but I'll show you one link. I have a couple of minutes before I finish. This is a list of countries by rating. Like, if you want to find a country, I love this on Wikipedia. It tells you the country, it tells you the rating, as Standard & Poor's, it goes through all these countries, it goes into Fitch, it goes into Moody's. So it's important to know, if you say, I want to sell into Mauritius, okay, it's BAA1 uh, stable, versus I want to sell into another country is negative, Gabon, or I want to sell into uh, Croatia, Costa Rica, now it's negative. It gives you a little bit some ideas. Exim Bank also have c country list like this, but then you have the doing business uh, website, how to do business. You have links in that website, but I like this one. Export Development Canada, you go to Country Info, for example, you, you say, I want to do business in Australia. And I love what this, what they say, Australia, open door, open. What this means, actively pursuing business. All EDC solutions are available in this market, subject to regular approval criteria. Like if you say, okay, let me go and see some other country. Here you have all these countries, it tells you. Afghanistan, open on highly restricted bases. Albania, open on restricted bases. Armenia, open. EDC position, for example, it tells you country by country, what's the EDC position from closed to, to open, limited information available, open on restricted bases, and then you can actually go in, let's say Haiti is res uh, on highly restricted bases, tells you the door almost closed, not total closed because it's restrictive, and then if they have other resources on the country, they will be listing that. This is a beautiful resource. Take advantage of that because many times we have, and then also go to the Department of Commerce, trade.gov, country commercial reports, all that. Don't be satisfied just with one source. Try to go to multiple sources. That's my recommendation to you. If you really want to be Versatile. These are some of the websites like export.gov, the Global Credit Consortium. That's a website I created to help my clients and the students in the high school. Exim.gov, trade.gov, state.gov, 
BIS, Bureau of Industry and Security, .doc.gov, CIA.gov, EDC.gov, that's CA Canada, and these are other. And remember this beautiful quote, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. Yes, international trade, globalization is a cave. There might be dark spots in that cave. Maybe as you try to enter the cave, it's totally dark. Yesterday I was watching, like when people go into a cave, they have a light. In Borneo, they were discovering, and they found a beautiful graffiti inside that's about, let's say, it's thousands of years old. Handprints of the original people and so forth. And they say that was the first time they ever discovered that cave recently in Borneo. So imagine, if somebody didn't take the initiative to enter, at the beginning as they were going to the cave, they felt, it's tiring, it's exhausting, it's not exciting. But when they reach deep into the cave and they put the light on those, they say, wow, the first time ever the, 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 uh, the expedition found those kinds of markings in that uh, cave in Borneo yesterday. So remember, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. And with this, it's 10 a.m. and the presentation is done. Thank you very much. How many of you have had a problem with a transaction? Anybody in the room? Thank you. Nobody? And I have to go to the you deck. Just for a breath, like, you know, for a moment, need, let's okay. all see what you kind need. of problem.
that? Call me first before you say no to the transaction, okay? <laughs> Don't just say no. Don't say no. But I know what he's talking about. Uh, international trade, like he said, is risky. Um, that's why the Exim Bank is here. Uh, before I go into my slides, my name is Brian Rothblatt. As uh, Vaselina mentioned, I've been with Exim Bank now for a few years. And I think I did the ETAP here a couple of years ago. Who's in the audience? Who's, who's seen me uh, speak before? It's, there's a few people in here that look familiar. I think I saw you last time. Okay. With no further ado, let's go ahead and get into this thing, guys. How many people have heard of Exim Bank prior to Eddie mentioning us? We have a few in the audience, okay? We're America's best kept secret, <laughs> obviously. Um, hopefully not anymore. My job is to do outreach and to teach you folks uh, about the Export-Import Bank and exactly what we do and how we can help uh, build your international portfolios. Start out with, we've been around since 1934. Politically, we've had our ebbs and flows. I know Eddie had mentioned us um, kind of going under for a while. That was roughly, I think, three or four weeks, maybe four Four years ago, I think, regardless of whether or not you're an ex, if you're an Exim Bank um, uh, client, if you have a policy with us, we're going to see that policy through, regardless of whatever's happening in D.C. or whatever's happening politically. Um, if the bank is up for reauthorization or we're not going to get reauthorized, if you have a policy with Exim Bank, we're going to make sure we see that through. And most pol policies typically run for about a year, okay? Um, we are an independent agency of the U.S. government under the executive branch, uh, obviously headquartered in Washington, D.C., and uh, we have 12 regional offices. The one I work in is in Irvine, California. Um, I also work in our Ontario ITA office now and again. That's with our Department of Commerce folks, um, and they're, they're very nice to me. They give me a little desk over there so I can stay within my territory. As I was telling Veselina, I recently took over the Riverside uh, San Bernardino counties about three months ago. Um, so if you do have a business in this area in San Bernardino, Riverside County, I'm your guy. Um, I have plenty of business cards and happy to give those uh, out to you after the presentation. And of course, our mission is to create and sustain jobs by increasing U.S. export sales. What does that mean? That means don't always say no to those international invoices, okay? Um, you might look on Google Maps, maybe they might be buying out of their garage, but guess where Google started? Out of a garage, okay? Um, and not bashing Eddie on that, I'm just saying we have what's called ECI, that's Export Credit Insurance, to help mitigate that risk, all right? So if you're looking on Google Earth, you see a questionable buyer, run a credit check on them, okay? I can assume that the majority of you are fairly new business owners. How many are advanced business owners? How many are currently exporting right now? Right now. We got two. You're currently exporting right now. How many buyers do you have overseas? Oh, we only have one buyer. One buyer? Okay. That's fine. One's, one's more than nothing. And you know that, uh, you know, domestic, uh, the domestic market right now is really good. Um, so I'm sure you guys are, are getting a lot of traction here in the States. <clears throat> It's funny, Exim Bank gets really busy once our domestic market starts to light on fire. People start to look internationally for business. Always keep your mind open, okay? And don't, don't, don't stay closed-minded. 95% of your sales are outside of the confines of the U.S., okay? So remember that. Our job is to minimize that risk. Uh, we level the playing field for you guys, enabling you guys to offer really cool competitive terms to your buyers. Uh, with that insurance, you guys can go to bed at night knowing that your stuff is being sent abroad and that Exim Bank is covering up to 95% of that deal, okay? Does that make sense? Risk protection, working capital, extending credit to buyers, term financing, those are all things that the Export-Import Bank are really strong at. Risk protection through our export credit and insurance, okay? We can, this enables you, so let's say, um, Who's your buyer from? Where's your buyer from located? He's located here in Ontario. So he's not international. He, your international buyer. He, he is the international, and most of ours is with Malaysia. Okay. And uh, Thailand, Argentina, and Brazil. Beautiful, beautiful. Are you currently offering terms to those buyers? I have no buyers? idea. I'm not in the money part of it. Understood. CFO's got all that under that control, the controller. Very good. No worries. 
<laughs> you don't want it to stretch you out, I understand. Well, hopefully you guys are protected, okay? Hopefully you guys have export credit insurance. What that does is, and what we do, and let me set, set the stage for you, okay? You're at a trade show. Who goes to trade shows here? Represent your product at a trade show, right? International trade shows. You never know who can be walking by your booth, right? Okay? What I like to do is I like to go up and introduce myself and say, hey, sir, how you doing? Strong probability, you got great, you got great product here. Could be a Chinese buyer, could be a Malaysian buyer, could be anybody walks past your booth today. You might or might not know that person. Even if you do know that person, how well do you know their finances, okay? My best friend, I wouldn't let him borrow five bucks from me, okay? I don't care if you play golf with your international buyer quarterly. I don't care if he's your cousin or she is your cousin. What they do on their own time is gonna affect your bottom line, okay? I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to give you the reality of the situation. Who's ever gotten stiffed by their best friend? I have, too, okay? Wish we had best friend insurance. <laughs> Working capital guarantees. Folks, if you get a million dollar order, you're a brand new company, you get a million dollar order from China, you're like, you're freaking out. You're like, this can't be real. Is this real? It's real, okay? You call the Export Import Bank, Let's say they're willing to give you 50% up front to get the product started, okay? You need that other 50% to start making the product. Maybe you need to bring on a couple more employees to get this million dollar deal done and to bring your business and boost your business, okay? Uh, the Exxon Bank will step in with that working capital. And like Eddie said, we don't lend money directly. We bring on what's called delegated authority lenders, okay? Commercial banks, just like Chase, just like Wells Fargo, okay? Uh, GBC International, who you'll be hearing from later, um, are some of our delegated authority lenders. And what those guys do, we enable them to underwrite loans on our behalf, okay? Assuming that they have the back office and the, uh, and the personnel to be able to do so, um, we will give them the delegated authority. Our DA lender list is on our website, okay? It's on xm.gov. You can see every lender that we work with. So don't call Brian for a loan. Okay, I'm not gonna be able to help you facilitate that loan, but I can introduce you to the banks that can. A lot of this can be done on your own too, but I'm always willing to help. Extending credit to buyers. The really cool thing about our insurance, um, on top of mitigating that risk and protecting your accounts receivables, is the fact that knowing that you, knowing that you, your, your receivables are protected, this gives you the generosity to open up the terms, okay, for your buyers. If you can afford it up front, offer those terms. Like Eddie said, many of these international buyers like the 30, 60, 90 day terms, okay? This is good for you guys. Term financing, we also do uh, buyer financing. If you have a buyer abroad that's looking at your product, they can't afford your product, assuming that they have the financial strength to be able to pay a loan back, the Exim Bank will take a look at that with our medium term financing, okay? Especially if it's commercial equipment and especially if you're selling to a country that's developing, developing nation, Africa, so forth. Uh, a lot of countries out there that don't have the infrastructure to be able to finance deals like that for your buyers, all right? So that's where Exim Bank, so we help you on multiple levels. We'll take care of your buyer. If they can't afford your product, we'll take care of them. If you need to hire people in house, uh, to, 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 to bring in some more inventory, to build the product, to get it done, to get that shipment out, Exim Bank will take care of you. Risk mitigation, Exim Bank will take care of you. All right, guys, so here's a little bit of metrics about us, okay? Um, this was dated back to 2017. I don't think we have anything for 19 or 18 yet, um, but this isn't too different from where we're at today. Um, we authorize, authorize more than 3.4 billion in export credit and working capital guarantees uh, to support roughly eight billion um, in U.S. exports. That's major, all right? It's a big deal. You know, when I walk into uh, an, an um, economic development agency like here in Riverside, and I talk to somebody like Vaselina, I say, hey, Vaselina, what's your job? She tells me, Brian, my job is to turn the needle economically. We're trying to build jobs, we're trying to build infrastructure, we're trying to look for foreign investment. I say, look, good way to build that, good way to meet your metric is to talk to me, all right, is to deal with your current exporters in your, in your local area that need major financing for these deals. Commercial banks, says, who's gone into a bank before looking for a loan on a trade deal? Has anybody done that yet? Nobody? 
Not yet. Well, if they have, likely they probably have turned you down just because banks don't like risk, right? They minimize their risk. Like I said, we deal with those banks and we say, hey bank, we're gonna insure you if they don't pay you, so give them a loan, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Assuming that you guys can pay back that loan too, right? All right, um, of this amount, roughly 2.2 billion was supported uh, in small business exporters. Nearly 64% of XM's total authorization came from small business exporters, 64%. The remaining are large companies, medium-sized companies. No size, no size of the company, no size of the deal is too large or small, okay? Um, I deal with medium-sized uh, companies, large-sized companies all day long, and these are defined by SBA. Who's looked at the SBA uh, com uh, company size chart before? Have you seen it? You looked on SBA's website, Martin C. Lander is going to come up here a little, a little while from SBA. Um, he'll explain that to you as well. Uh, you can get on there and you can take a look at whether or not your own personal business is large or small based on your NAICS code, N-A-I-C-S code, okay? We go by that, SBA goes by that, you know, all of our DA lenders are going to go by that. So your financing is going to be based on the size of your company, all right? Um, more than 2,240 small business transactions 91% of the total 240, 60. Like I said, no company, no deal is too small. That's a lot of business transactions. That's a lot of jobs being created. That's a lot of commerce being done. Go America. All right, so eligibility requirements. Um, these fluctuate, all right, based on the strength of your buyer and the strength of your financials, okay? Um, I've seen companies in business for one year that exceed 300,000 in, in total sales. Pretty good, right? It's not bad, you know? They're getting off to a pretty strong start. Exxon Bank will look at that, you know? If you come in with some strong financials, um, our delegated authority lenders uh, could possibly be interested in that deal. Um, so roughly three years, have financial statements or tax returns and your company must have a DUNS number. If you don't know what a DUNS number is, um, if you don't have one, speak to me. Uh, I have all the information I can email to you guys to go ahead and get you set up with that. It's pretty easy, all right? Uh, for working capital and short-term insurance, uh, the exported products and services, guys, they always got to be at least 50% American-made, all right? We like American-made, and so do international buyers. Um, I, she's dealing with international buyers now. If you don't know, Made in USA is, is really, really strong worldwide. So if your product's made here in the United States, we'll look at that. Let's assume that your product is made in China. Let's assume that you bring it in from China, and let's say that uh, your warehousing, all your aggregate costs of um, building that product and piecing it together, paying your employees, shipping it uh, domestically, internationally, if that outweighs the cost, the original cost of that purchase in bulk from China, we'll look at it. That's 50 plus percent American made, right? For medium term insurance and guarantees, Exported products and services must be at least 85% U.S. content. We raise the bar, obviously. Uh, medium and long term can go up to roughly 10 years. Uh, the longer the deal goes on, the more risk. We just want to really ensure that that U.S. content is strong and that we are taking care of the American economy, all right? And the American business owner, you, all right? You guys are the economy. Um, let's see. That includes labor, that excludes markup and cost basis for full support of the transaction, okay? So we can include labor, like I said, on that 85%. There's look, anybody out there looking for a medium-term insurance or guarantee. What I like about the medium-term insurance, it's really cool if you're selling to an underdeveloped country, all right? And you're looking for, you know, roughly maybe a five-year deal. Uh, let's say it's five, 10 million. We insure our banks up to 100% on those medium term deals, 100%. We go to Wells Fargo and we say, hey, if he doesn't pay you, we'll pay the full entire amount, all right? This really makes deals like that attractive for you guys, okay? This opens up the gateway for you guys to go ahead and get your business done. All right, so all of our working capital guarantees, um, Call these WCGs are asset-based, fully collateralized loans. Personal guarantees are required for owners, all right? So if you're looking for a working capital guarantee, here's the deal. The cost is 100% or $100 application fee, and uh, there's typically a 1.75% facility fee, 
all right? And you can see the reductions up there. That 1.75 is a, is a one-time rate um, that's paid, and that typically goes to the banks. And like I said, our working capital guarantee, you wouldn't call me for that product. You would call our delegated authority lenders. Um, and you could call me, and I will give you the list of the delegated authority lenders, and I can even make the introduction for you if needs be, all right? No big deal. No sweat off my back. All right, so let's see. Does anybody have any questions so far? Am I talking too fast? We all good, loud and clear? I'm sorry, so exactly what is this insurance? This is an insurance, this is a, this is a loan. This is working capital guarantee. So uh, like I was mentioning earlier, you have a buyer in China. Um, you get a huge PO uh, that you can't take care of in-house. They're only willing to give you 20% up front. You're like, where's the rest of the 80? Right? I, I, I need inventory, I need people, I, I need to get this invoice done and taken care of um, or else I can't complete that action and you won't win the sale. Right? You come to uh, XM Bank, we set you up with a DAA lender. Um, you're roughly going to pay 1.75, but the interest rates are based on the bank, not us. All right? Based on your financial strength and based on your buyer's financial strength as well. Yes, sir? Uh, what's the difference between this and factoring? Uh, I'm assuming cost. But cost. Yeah. Yeah, cost. Cost is different. I mean, on factoring, you're giving up a lot on those receivables, right? Okay. So basically, in factoring, what you're doing is flipping your receivables for money. <laughs> it's kind of like a payday loan, almost, right? Um, for the desperate business owner. Uh, let's try to stay away from that. Let's not even talk about factoring right now. I know desperate, de desperate times call for desperate measures, but uh, there's ways around those. Okay. So only does guarantees, not insurance. But we do insurance, export credit insurance. That's our bread and butter, 100%. Uh, you just have to have, a, yeah, yeah, one of the, uh, one of any of the above, and two, you just have to have a Dunn's number, uh, be in business at least three years, okay, uh, products 50% plus American made, some other nuances and stuff like that, but nothing major. It's like going to apply for a car loan, guys. Look, if you, if, if you have a six, 500 FICO, good luck on the high interest, or good luck on a good interest rate on that car, okay, it's all the same stuff. Mm. And then when Mr. Trump put the, you know, the tariffs on the tariffs on the China on exports from China, mm -hmm. the guy couldn't compete anymore, and so he just went bankrupt. Mm. And you no longer got your product. We no, not only no longer got our product. The in China, there's no bankruptcy laws or anything like this. Mm. The guy had to run out of China because they were threatening to kill him. And we lost, he saved as much of our dyes and tooling mm. as he could, and they walked off with the rest of it. That's terrible. I'm sorry and to hear that. it put us almost a year behind in our deliveries to our customers. I'm very sorry to hear about that. Yeah, we can't protect you against that. <laughs> I said we can, we don't have any insurance against that, per se. <clears throat> Obviously, that was, a, that was the United States president. Uh, calling for those actions, but it was the tit for tat between the two, right? Yeah. So, okay, I'm, I'm going to tariff you this. Okay, we're going to get you back. Okay, it's been like that. But um, you're talking about how things can change. sway. It was just bang overnight. Yeah, done. just like that. Companies go insolvent overnight. Like uh, overnight. Like I said, my best friend will tell me he's got money in the bank all day. I know he doesn't. You know what <laughs> I mean? I know he doesn't. You know, because the ILA, cool call. Hey man, let me get ten bucks now and again. We're almost forty, man. Come on, let's go. Not in high school anymore. Um, but like I said, insure yourself, protect yourself. That type of stuff, that's very unfortunate. Nothing that our export credit insurance can do for you there. Uh, but circling back to our export credit insurance, we are going to go further and a little bit deeper here. And here we go. All right. So back, sir, back to your question there, the export credit insurance. Here's the benefits. Obviously, risk protection, okay? Um, we do anywhere from 30 to 60 to 90 days. Typically, 30 days is, is right right around our sweet spot there. Um, but again, that protects you guys against non-payment by your foreign buyer due to any sort of commercial or political risk, okay? Um, it's a great sales tool, all right? Obviously, if you know your product's insured, okay, you can offer those terms that you want to offer. If they come to you and say, oh, you know, we want 90 days, you can play, now you can play the negotiation uh, game and now you can uh, uh, be a little bit stronger in those negotiations. Um, the financing aid, you can obtain additional financing based on those 
um, insured receivables, all right? Uh, so your insured receivables may be added to your borrowing base by assignment of policy proceeds to a lender, all right? Um, so the risks covered, like I said, are commercial risks. That's if the uh, buyer goes insolvent, bankrupt, uh, protracted default, political risks, any sort of transfer risk, war, revolution, insurrection, uh, expropriation, uh, the cancellation of an import or an export license, that happens too, all right? Um, these things you always just need to be cognitive of, okay, and understand that anything, anything goes. Um, the cool thing is, oh, go ahead. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So, uh, w so the cool thing that Department of Commerce did during this past trade war is we we set up what was called I think a two thirteen exchange where we provided waivers uh, for a lot of the companies that were affected by this trade deal. Um, so there's a lot of companies out there that are yeah you know we're, we're really being threatened by this trade deal and and the tariffs are high and. You know, importing, exporting is becoming too expensive. It's really hurting our business. Uh, we, we, there's some waivers out there for stuff like that, you know. It's on their website. Um, so we do provide protection. Um, trade wars mm, gets tough. gets tough in the, in the trade war. But we will, per, we, yeah, it's a gray area. Um, so let's moving forward. So our express insurance, guys. So if, for those of you who are fairly new to exporting, our express insurance is a beautiful product for you guys, okay? Um, Eddie uh, earlier was talking about uh, credit, um, uh, doing credit checks on companies. I can run anywhere between like three to $500, um, just depending on, depending on the company you're dealing with in the, in the country. Um, we do those for free under ex our Express Insurance. I'm not selling you on those free, um, those free credit checks, but they're huge. If you're protected our, under our Express Insurance, uh, we can cover up to 10 buyers, guys. Um, this is what's called a multi-buyer policy. Multi-buyer, meaning you have multiple buyers. So for you, you have multiple buyers abroad right now in multiple different countries. This express policy would be really, really good for you. It's a great- I, I misunderstood. I, I thought you said you know, global sales rep. Um, yeah, we have probably about 10 buyers. There you go. Between the three companies. It's beautiful, yeah. So, I mean, this is, this is perfect for a company like yours. Uh, we'll cover up to 95%, again, commercial political risk, okay? Company goes insolvent, uh, they can't pay you, we'll cover up to 95% of that transaction, okay? Um, Eddie mentioned earlier, you can go see a broker. We do pay brokers uh, to, to, um, to take care of you guys and lead you through the process. I can do that as well, all right? If you're looking for, for insurance, give me a call. Um, we can set up that application together. Um, I can connect you with a broker as well. Connecting with a broker is better for long term, all right? You can actually you know, consider them as one of your partners uh, you know, in longer term transactions. All right, so our multi-buyer policy is very similar to our express, all right? The multi-buyer will also cover 95% of that transaction. Uh, there's no deductible pay as you go. Some buyer approval authority may be given to the exporter, okay? Um, so this is a pay as you go policy. Unlike car insurance or any other insurance you have, you pay month to month, you're not sure whether or not you're gonna get an accident next month. Uh, you feel like you're wasting money. Um, this is a pay-as-you-go plan, okay? We understand that oftentimes you're not going to be shipping product every single month uh, to your foreign buyer. So um, what you're going to do under our policies, you're going to go on to what's called uh, the X R R E O L um, base. And, and if you guys do apply, I'll give you all the information that you need. Uh, and again, anytime you ship, you report that shipment, and you're good under our, our policy, okay? Single buyer, that's one buyer. Uh, okay, so if you just have one buyer abroad, that's fine. Uh, we can cover that one buyer. 90% um, coverage, a uh, little more uh, risk involved with that. And again, there's no deductible. All right, so back to the express insurance. Um, I touched on that a little bit earlier. That is 10 buyers or less on credit terms, okay? So this is not cash in advance stuff. This is, this is terms. It's 30, 60, 90 day deals, all right? Um, we can cover up to 10 buyers on that. Um, Let's see, uh, not currently insured by XM or any private sector insurer uh, for their accounts receivable, exporting on credit terms for less than five years, okay? Uh, some of our entry level gateways to get into this uh, express insurance policy, all right? We don't wanna see, if you've done more than 7.5 million over the course of the past three years, um, this express policy is not gonna be conducive for you. You're a stronger exporter, you won't qualify. 
So key fe features, again, um, insuring against uh, uh, existing buyers, um, no deductible, um, no application fee. It's a streamlined process, typically takes a couple of weeks. So if you guys have buyers in mind right now, if you have POs that have been shot out to your inbox and you're sitting on them and you're wondering, hey, what should I do? Where is this company at? Where are they located? We have what's called a country limitation schedule, okay? It's a CLS. Again, it's on XM.gov. I'll give you my card at the end of the thing, at the end of this presentation, and uh, I'll be sure to send you guys that information. That country limitation schedule, Eddie was showing you guys uh, the one from Canada. They were showing you uh, other various, uh, I think, one off of Wikipedia. Um, those are fine. Go to our, use our country limitation schedule. Um, we have professional economists. I think the SBA goes off of our country limitation schedule. I'm not sure. Um, maybe Martin, Martin's giving me the thumbs up on that. Um, so it's 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 very good uh, uh, baseline to know whether or not the country you're dealing in is a good country to be dealing in or a bad one. All right, um, we have restrictions in some underdeveloped countries, uh, but most countries are wide open and, and, and ready for business. And you can see here uh, that express uh, insurance. I, I take that back. Roughly a five day um, buyer approval turnaround on credit terms of 300 grand or less. Okay. So you got a product that you're trying to insure for under 300,000. We can get that pro uh, we can get that this insurance policy done in under a week and uh, have you on your way and protected. So the rates, guys, um, we run off of 30 day terms uh, in a nice, clean, developed country under this express uh, insurance plan is 65 basis points, guys. So if you do a uh, $52,000 deal abroad, you're looking at a $325 uh, premium payment on that deal, okay? 50 to 325. So essentially you're multiplying by 0 0.0065 on each hundred dollars of that deal, okay? So it's pretty easy. You can see that up there. Um, <laughs> not a bad rate to, uh, to, to enable you to sleep all eight hours in the night and not worry about that payment coming through, right? <clears throat> Let's see. If you use that insurance with a working capital guarantee, um, there's a 25% rate reduction. A lot of times when you go in for that working capital guarantee, a lender will like to see your, uh, uh, want to insure that product or, or insure, you know, make sure that product's insured as well um, to give you that rate reduction. And uh, you know, it's a good way to go in and get some financing as well. Multi-buyer policy, um, it, it's an express policy, okay? The express policy is a multi-buyer policy. Uh, like I said, we'll take care of up to 10 buyers for you. Uh, the small business multi-buyer policy is more advanced than that express, okay? So like I said, if you've done more than 7.5 million over the course of the past three years, or you're doing larger transactions and you're an experienced exporter, um, you're not gonna qualify for that, expo uh, that express insurance policy. We'll probably put you under the small business um, multi-buyer policy. And you can see the coverage is up there. Again, that's 95% coverage, guys. That's huge, all right? 95%, it's a big deal. All right, standard business multi-buyer policy, very, very similar. Uh, it's flexible policy for experienced exporters. Once again, if you're experienced, if you guys are already turning and burning, doing business abroad, um, this is a great policy for you guys. Uh, under this, you gotta insure all of your credit sales. We wanna see all of that business, okay, come in. So uh, we're not gonna do the onesie twosies. We wanna see your whole um, uh, international portfolio on this. And again, we cover up to 95%. And it's a pay-as-you-go pay policy, okay? So it's not like car insurance where you're paying every, every month. Uh, you pay as you ship. Short-term single buyer, like I said, guys, that's 90% coverage different than the multi-buyer. Uh, multi um, we're going to go 5% less than that. And it's 98% for bulk ag transactions, 95% for letters uh, LC transactions, okay? So we're going to give you a little bit more if you're backed on that LC, all right? A um, little less risky. Right, we'll insure more, less risk. Um, there's no deductible. Uh, the application fee, I believe, on this is a uh, reduced $500 minimum um, for all small business exporters, okay? And $2,500 for all large business exporters. I don't think there's any large businesses in this building, um, but that's fine. Again, back to that country limitation schedule. Uh, it's a big deal, guys. Um, you know, if you're looking at doing uh, businesses, uh, you know, if you're looking at doing business in Africa, any of the uh, underdeveloped country, you wanna take a look at our CLS, okay? Our country limitation schedule. Um, look, if we red flag it, you should probably red flag it too, all right? I'm not saying that everybody in this world is bad. We're just saying that um, the country itself 
and their ability to, uh, to, to deal with their own personal international trade um, is limited and it's a risky business for us. We're not saying don't do the deal, we're just saying that we might not insure you on that deal, all right? And again, you'll see it right on our, right on our thing here. Once you go into XM.gov and see the CLS, it's gonna be quite easy. Why for open? In, not open, all right? And if we are open and there are restrictions, you'll see that too, all right? And you can call me if you have any questions about any of those restrictions. Um, so here's some success stories, guys. Uh, Andalou Naturals, uh, you can see that they've done business out in UAE, uh, $2.7 million deal, supported 21 jobs. Um, this was, uh, I believe, through our insurance program, enabled them to offer really strong terms to their buyer. And um, at the end of the day, she's happy, she's scaling, she's growing. That's what we want, okay? That's the whole point of this thing is to ensure that next time I see you guys at the next DTAP next year, you guys will have graduated from the express policy into our multi-buyer policy. And that, that maybe you're just too big for us and you're self-insuring at that point, right? That's, that's the whole goal. Another success story, guys, Gunter and Zinnerman. Um, they did a deal out in Czech Republic. Uh, it's another insurance deal for $1.4 million. Again, enabled them to, uh, to, to sleep better at night and to uh, you know, bring on more employees and, and scale their business through our insurance policies. It's a really, really good sales tool, guys. Don't look at it just insurance, all right? Um, and just protection. Look at it as terms, all right? Being strong in negotiations. These are, these are really good uh, sales points for you guys. And that's my ugly mug up there on the stage. Again, guys, I'm Brian Rothblatt with the XM Bank. If you guys have any questions about anything I just spoke of, um, I have tons of information on our website. Um, I can send pieces of this, uh, this PowerPoint to you um, along with uh, our, our marketing collateral. And uh, we're always open for business and willing to help you guys out and watch your companies grow, okay? That's all I have today. Does anybody have any questions? We're good? Thank you. Thanks for your time.
big program that we're putting on for all the lenders in the region. So uh, thank you all. It's time to get going. Gardner, are you ready to begin? Who's going to be here next week? You know, your boss's boss's boss. Ah, uh, okay. The associate administrator. Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you, Vesna. Right. right. Okay, Paul. All right. So, okay, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hi. Um, uh, Paul, thank you so much for inviting me. And uh, Veselina and Riverside County are awesome partners. Great to be with you. Thank you. So much. Appreciate the invitation, Paul. So, um, as Paul mentioned, um, uh, I'm Martin Sealander. I'm from Small Business Administration uh, from our International Trade Office in, uh, in Irvine at our U.S. Export Assistance Center. And uh, Paul, of course, uh, from our local district office in, uh, in Santa Ana, Orange County Inland Empire District Office. So SBA has about 69 or 70 uh, local district offices focusing and coordinating SBA and domestic assistance programs, our domestic loan programs, uh, government contracting, procurement assistance, okay. minority business development. And uh, uh, our office at the International Trade Office, uh, Export Assistance Center, focusing more on our, on our export financing programs, which I'll be dedicating most of my time here to. Um, we have, um, uh, so we have a SBA presence in about uh, 19 or 20 export assistance centers around the country. So again, I'm in Orange County, Irvine. Uh, I have my colleague Pelson, he's in Los Angeles. So we work together to cover Southern California uh, and Nevada and Arizona, uh, coordinating and supporting SBA export financing programs. And uh, I believe uh, you may have perhaps heard at an earlier session, uh, Paul, uh, someone from commercial service. Paul, did you have a speaker uh, from our uh, Export Assistance Center here in Ontario? Perhaps they were another session. If not, maybe they'll be on the next session. Uh, so our, our, our lead, you just heard from my friend Brian from Export Import Bank. Uh, yours truly here from SBA, and then our third partner at the Export Assistance Center, uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce, Commercial Service. And Paul, excuse me, did you, is there someone from Commercial Service coming next week, Paul, or did they already? Eric, okay, great. So three legs on the Export Assistance Center stool, SBA, XM, and then you heard from Erica from Commercial Service, focusing more on marketing, promotion type support, market research, market intelligence. So all levels of international trade related uh, program support and services. So, oh, and there's my friend Paul. And so, um, okay, let me jump in then to our, our financing support. So that's essentially what, what the main focus uh, uh, for myself, my colleague Pelson, supporting our export financing program. So, um, SBA, um, we have over a dozen different financing programs throughout SBA, depending how much money you need the, and depending on the specific requested use of the proceeds, we can find a, a round hole to fit your square peg. But uh, one important point every program has in common uh, is that everything is coordinated through our loan guarantee authority, uh, meaning that uh, we, we are not a bank. I don't have a checkbook here. SBA does not make direct government business loans. But uh, rather, we work in partnership with local participating commercial lenders, including the one you're going to hear from in just a few moments uh, from GBC Bank when I'm concluded here. So we provide our federal SBA guarantee on the bank loan or bank credit line made to your company. And I, I always like to say to really oversimplify, you can sort of Think of us almost as co-signing with you on that bank loan, meaning that, heaven forbid, if you were to default on this loan in the future, heaven forbid, or your company went out of business. Or my favorite example, Paul, if you take the money and run away to the Caribbean, which did happen to one of my loans many years ago, then SBA will step in, pay off the lender up to the extent of our guarantee. So lenders under less risk, more willing to extend credit to you in the first place. So you are the customer of the bank bank is really the customer of SBA. So that's very oversimplified uh, SBA 101. 
So we have three, uh, three tools in our international trade toolbox um, as far as export finance support programs. And our flagship program is our Export Working Capital, EWCP. And um, uh, this is, uh, this is a, a somewhat similar program to one that is offered by Brian and Export-Import Bank. And uh, forgive me, I was kind of uh, fading in and out during Brian's presentation, so I'm not sure how much time he might have spent on this. So uh, forgive me if I repeat anything. They have a similar program, though. This is designed as a short-term financing tool to provide short-term cash to help an exporter to fulfill terms and conditions of your export contracts, purchase orders, letters of credit that you have negotiated with your foreign buyers. So uh, we can step in and assist you on uh, the pre-shipment guarantee basis. So most common where you've, you've got an order, you've got a contract to deliver goods or services uh, to your foreign buyer, but you need cash prior to shipment, pre-shipment. You need cash to fill the order. So we can lend to you against that sales order. So you've got cash to perform, pay for inventory, raw materials, shipping costs, labor, pay your vendors, pay for supplies, whatever cost specifically and exclusively uh, are needed to perform on that specific export sale. And then we can also potentially structure the support on a, a post-shipment guarantee structure. So a case where um, you have already shipped, you've already performed, and I know Brian touched on this a little bit. So you've already shipped, you're awaiting payment uh, so maybe you have, uh, a, you got a cash down payment perhaps from the, uh, from the buyer or maybe you already have a credit line facility, uh, whatever the case may be, you've shipped, now you're awaiting payment. So maybe working with Brian, Exim Bank, you've extended 60, 90 day terms to the buyer. So we can structure a facility collateralized by that future account receivable and so you can immediately take a cash draw you don't have to wait 60, 90 days to get paid. SBA will hold that foreign receivable or that term used in letter of credit. Uh, so the point is there, again, you don't have to wait to get paid. You keep your cash flow rolling. You can move on to your next deal. Uh, again, to repeat, emphasize, clarify, again, this is a short-term financing program. So um, we'll work with you to establish a maturity so you've got enough time to deliver and perform and get paid for the sale. Uh, generally that's going to be less than 12 months so very short term and um, again transaction based so um, our source of repayment for this loan coming from the collection of the proceeds of the sale from the foreign buyer. So uh, it's what we call a self-liquidating loan. So this is not a five-year car loan or a 30-year home mortgage where you're making a fixed set monthly payment every month. It's not an American Express card that you can just run up and uh, you know, make an interest-only payment or a minimum payment as you wish. Uh, Self-liquidating. As soon as proceeds are collected from the foreign buyer, that money immediately pays down the advance. Uh, and so we can support sales, uh, most typically against a letter of credit transaction. Most of our deals are on LC, but certainly we absolutely, we can support open account sales. So you heard a few moments ago from my good friend Brian and all the advantages uh, available to you if you're willing and able to be more flexible to your buyer and extend competitive, attractive open account terms to your buyer. A lot of great advantages for you in that regard, as Brian explained. So either kind of a structure is acceptable. Um, one of the real key advantages of this program, though, um, uh, unlike more traditional commercial financing, as I mentioned a moment ago, the repayment source coming from collection of sales proceeds. So um, we're really kind of working and thinking outside the box with this program compared to more traditional standard commercial lending guidelines. So 
We're not looking so closely at your, your collateral, your net worth, profitability, your cash flow. Of course, we do look at those elements, certainly. But what's really important here is, is uh, the real essence of this loan is your performance on the sales contract and then the subsequent collection uh, of the sales proceeds from the foreign buyer. So performance risk and then repayment risk. So um, jumping ahead a little bit here though, performance risk. So we need to be comfortable that you can deliver. So what is your track record, your managerial capacity, your experience, your education? Are you, are you gonna be able to deliver uh, on this contract? And then repayment risk. So who's the buyer? How are we getting paid? Um, if you've extended open terms to the buyer, do we have an insurance policy to protect those receivables? If there's a letter of credit that's been issued, um, you know, what is the, the credibility of that foreign bank? So if those two elements are reasonable, chances are good that uh, all things considered that we can help you. So even a company that might have uh, you know, weak collateral, weak net worth, sketchy profitability or cash flow, we have some real flexibility with this program to, to assist an applicant. So as I said, it's really kind of, uh, I think, a very user-friendly and outside-the-box kind of a tool. Uh, uh, yes, please, uh, please, yes, sorry. This sort of based on, um, um, what specifically is the underwriting criteria that you're looking at if it's not based necessarily on cash flow or profitability? There's no... Um, okay, well, credit or, uh, so we, you know, let me repeat and clarify. I mean, we certainly do look at your cash flow and profitability, but um, it's what? Over, it, it, it's not a deal killer if it's, if it's a new business or if it's a business so, that through, you know, some kind of crisis. So as far as, okay, as a, as a new business. So um, the, the, the key there is, is performance risk, right? So our, our ballpark rule of thumb at SBA is we, we like to see you've been in operation at least 12 months and that you've made, you've generated revenue, that you've made some past sales. So that, again, so that we can be comfortable and the bank can be comfortable that you can deliver. So having said that though, 12 months in business, okay, you, but um, uh, you might approach a lender and the bank has their own internal guidelines and they say, you know, sorry, we don't care what SBA says, we want to see two years track record, or three. So um, you'll hear shortly from my friend, Mr. Josephson, giving you the, the banking perspective on, on that. Um, uh, and it's, very, it's a real subject, sorry, there's not really a short answer to this question, I'm sorry. It's really a subjective uh, kind of a process. Um, so maybe you have only been in business for six months, but uh, You've been working as export manager for ABC company for 25 years and you've retired or decided to branch out, start your own business and you have this wealth of knowledge and experience capacity that you bring to this endeavor and you can explain and clarify that in your business plan. Yeah, we'll certainly be willing okay, so to, to look, look at that. Plan, There's the of the, um, all the above, yes. And th so this program, this is really, um, you know, SBA last year approved like 68,000 loans. I mean, this is really a small program in SBA. So um, you know, we're really a lot more hands-on involved with these loans. It's uh, not just really an assembly line, cookie cutter type of an approach with this program. So um, there's a lot more touches, a lot more SBA eyes looking at the deals and working with you to structure it and find a way to get that square peg into that round hole. So uh, we're, we're a lot more user friendly with these kind of deals. We will, we will bend, this, but not break, we'll bend as far as we can. So sorry, there isn't really a quick, easy answer to that, that question. Now, if you, know, if, you have, you know, if you have poor credit or you know, you're in the middle of a bankruptcy or something dreadful like this, um, you know, those things like that that we we can't overcome. Yes? Um, just 
just out of curiosity, so with certain programs like this, the, with the as an exporter, would the buyer be more would the buyer's credit be more important than the seller's credit as an exporter? Um, I, I wouldn't say more important, but that is one of the key elements. So re repayment risk. So okay, we want to know what is this? What's the source of repayment? So if you, most of our deals, are, most are in support of a letter of credit type sale. So in that case, and um, sorry, I came in late. My good friend Eddie Sumar probably talked a little bit about letters of credit. But in that case, your foreign buyer has gone to their foreign bank, opened a letter of credit put up collateral at their foreign bank and open the LC in your favor. And so in that case, you know, we don't care who the foreign buyer is. We're, we care who the foreign bank is. And they're, they're the ones who are going to pay on the LC. So um, you know, if it's a really uh, sketchy, little known foreign bank of, of limited credibility, you know, we might have a problem with that or maybe work with you to get a more um, credit credible foreign bank to open the LC. Um, if, and if you're selling on open account terms to a foreign buyer, perfectly acceptable as well. But n now we want to know a little bit more about the foreign buyer's credibility. So many times we might ask Exim Bank uh, or a local private sector insurer to insure or protect the receivable. Or if you're selling to um, uh, a, a foreign federal government, perhaps we can work around that, or a, a well-known um, multinational, you know, Fortune 500 type of a company, uh, you know, Sony in Japan or something like that, or Toyota in Japan or uh, Walmart France or somewhere. And we can maybe work around that and not require the insurance. So that's to that extent. That's how we review the and consider the credibility of, of the foreign buyer. So did that sort of answer your question? Sure. OK. And for American, um, this is only for American. These programs are only for American owned um, or registered companies, right? Uh, right? Yes, right. But we can, uh, non-citizens certainly are eligible for SBA financing support. Yes. Um, as long as the company is registered or Incorporated in the U.S. And certainly, the company needs to be incorporated absolutely in in the U.S. Yes, um, and we we're getting a little deep into the weeds here, but we need we also need guarantees of corporate ownership management. And if those parties are not U.S. citizens, that's not ineligible. But we need to clarify and verify their legal residency status here. So, for example, if you are a foreign student and you're here on a foreign student visa, we're not, or you're a tourist, we're not going to be able to support that. We need to see that you're a legal permanent resident. How about joint ventures? 51% um, American owned um, foreign investor actually resides in another country. Uh, not a problem, but if that foreign investor owns 49% of the business, even though they're domiciled in a foreign country, we need to see financial statements from that company. And they need to pledge a corporate guarantee, worthless as it may be. They need to sign and offer a guarantee. But it's not ineligible, though. So um, how much time do I have here, Paul Smith, till 1130? So OK, we can structure one specific single identifiable sales transaction. Or many of our loans are set up as a revolving credit facility. Um, typically, in that case, we, we approve the loan, uh, generally limited to a 12-month maturity. And then throughout the 12 months, as you negotiate eligible export sales, it's just a simple matter of you requesting a draw from the lender. And so we can fi finance an infinite number of potential future sales. But again, any draw that you take, we need to see evidence. You need to show that the funds are being used to support an export sales transaction. No minimum amount for any SBA loan. Different programs have different maximums. This program maximum up to $5 million. And uh, user-friendly collateral requirements. So as far as collateral for this program, so um, do I have a slide on that? No, I skipped that slide. So um, since we're 
the use of this money is to finance a short-term export transaction. So typically what we're looking at for collateral is um, uh, a, a collateral lien on whatever raw materials, inventory, nuts and bolts are being purchased with this money. Uh, second, we require a, a assignment of the future payment proceeds to be pledged back to, to us, to SBA uh, and the bank. Uh, third, as I mentioned a couple times here now, uh, Congress requires us to always take a personal guarantee. Any corporate partner or stockholder who holds 20% or more ownership interest is always required to sign personal guarantee for any SBA loan. Under this program, nine times out of 10, 99 times out of 100, that's an unsecured guarantee. Very different from a standard non-export traditional SBA working capital type loan where in that case a guarantee would also be required but quite often additional collateral would be pledged. For example, quite often a, a second mortgage lien on your house. That's uh, very rarely the case for this program. Uh, rare but not impossible. So fourth, there's always that wild card potentially depending on the overall risk of the proposition, SBA or the bank you're working with case-by-case -case basis might request or require additional collateral. But that's really more the exception than the rule. So to sum that up, uh, collateral-wise, we're just really generally just focusing on the export transaction, and we're just generally interested in the export-related assets and the export proceeds from that transaction. So it's not uncommon for us if, to work with a company that might have other debt on the books, you might have other loans or credit lines, and maybe your collateral is tied up to support those deals. Uh, it's not uncommon, and we have flexibility to kind of work our way around that um, and, and just uh, require and secure a collateral lien on these export-related assets that we're financing. A quick question on Please. the personal guarantors, uh, on the guarantees. Is that dischargeable on the bankruptcy, or is it like, like student loans that they're never dischargeable? Um, you know, I'm not really sure about the ins and outs of that. I'm not an attorney, sorry. Um, we'll have to look into that for you. Or my friend, Mr. Joseph from the lender, might know more about that. Sorry? Are you an attorney? Probably help one time. I'm actually experienced. So it depends on the type of guarantee that you sign. So if it's a lien on the title, then because it's a lien on the title, you can almost think of it as a separate entity. So even if you go through a discharge of the bankruptcy, it only discharges the personal and not the title aspect. So if you do do if you secure an SBA through um, through your property, mm. even if you go through a discharge of bankruptcy, it's still on title. So depending on how you work it out, it can bite you in the butt in the long run. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, uh, this program and the other two that I'm about to get to, uh, we, we can support indirect exporters as well. So anyone that's uh, involved in the supply chain, if you're not necessarily specifically an exporter of record, but we can clarify that uh, somehow you are in the supply chain, and even though you have um, a contract for a domestic sale, if we can just clarify, get that in writing, uh, we could potentially support you with financing under these three programs. So there's a real simple example. If you're making wine bottles and you're selling the empty bottles to the winery, they fill it with wine, they export the wine, so you have a domestic sale, we, we can assist uh, with export financing. Um, I had a real life example, I had a company in LA a few years ago and their business was to uh, provide, uh, do uh, upholstery work for airplane seats. So they had a contract with Boeing to do this upholstery work for uh, a 737 aircraft. And Boeing is going to sell the airplane to Air Canada or Air France. So um, it's a domestic sale, but we were able to clarify that in the pipeline. And we were able to support that company with, uh, with export financing support. Um, and I think this is my last slide here. Just a couple of eligibility. Uh, issue. So we have a, you know, our guidelines, our standard operating procedure of eligibility issues is like a New York phone book. But 
Just a couple of quick important highlights uh, we've referenced a few times in this conversation. Uh, exporter must demonstrate ability to perform on this loan. So we, SBA has many different loans to uh, support, encourage, assist newer, inexperienced startup companies. And uh, my friend Paul Smith and his colleagues at the SBA Santa Ana Orange County District Office uh, can maybe assist you with some of those options. But this is not one of those programs, again, really not designed for newer, inexperienced startup types of companies. We'll, we'll always consider a reasonable exception. But as I mentioned earlier, our, our rule of thumb, we like to see even in operation ballpark, give or take at least 12 months. Service and trading companies certainly are eligible. Do not necessarily have to be a manufacturer. So sometimes to illustrate the points, it's easy to talk about uh, nuts and bolts or inventory. But we certainly can and do support service type companies. So if you have a contract, uh, you're an engineering firm, consulting firm, architecture type firm, you have an international contract, you're not putting something in a box and shipping it, certainly can support that. Likewise, trading companies. So we do have many credit lines for export trading companies. They're not manufacturing anything, uh, but you've got a foreign buyer, you have a, a source, a vendor, a supplier here in the US, and you're able to book a sale. So companies that are for example, exporting scrap, scrap metal, scrap paper, food, commodities, uh, some uh, credit lines for companies uh, who are brokering the sale of, for example, American meat, American beef to Korea, a large um, uh, Korean diaspora in the Los Angeles area, and um, Korean, uh, American beef is highly, uh, prized in Korea, so these uh, one woman, one man operations, they've got sources at the slaughterhouses and the stockyards in Chicago, the stuff goes on a rail car to the port of LA, on the boat, out it goes, they never see it, they never touch it, perfectly eligible. How am I doing for time, Paul? Are you giving me the hook? No. Five minutes? Um, another hour. <laughs> uh, country limitation schedule, so you heard from my friend, uh, uh, Brian mentioned about the country limitation schedule, so certain bad guys on the list, and then there are some limitations, other countries, depending on economic related uh, issues or questions uh, with the credibility of the financial or uh, banking system in those countries, we want to be cognizant of that. Credit insurance, so we heard from Brian about that. Uh, again, just to repeat the point here, if if you are selling on open account terms, generally SBA will require that the receivable is protected against default with the commercial export credit insurance policy, either from XM or a local private sector insurer. Um, and then as far as the application, so ultimately where the rubber hits the road, nothing gets done until there's a lender on board. And I know my friend Mr. Josephson is eager to get up here uh, he'll be next. Um, so the lender plays the key role in the process um, for any SBA loan. Step one, for you to submit your loan proposal request uh, to the bank. Uh, the lender would work with you. If they like what they see, they'll work with you to prepare any necessary application materials and documentation. They have their own internal credit committee guidelines. Uh, once they've reviewed it internally, then they would send that file for us to review at SBA. So you are the customer of the bank. Bank is the customer of SBA. <clears throat> so that's very oversimplified. Uh, Dave, two more minutes. I want to cover uh, Express and International Trade Loan quickly. Uh, OK, let me change the channel here real quick, uh, Paul. Um, I have four minutes till 11.30? OK, great. Two minutes for this, two minutes for International Trade. So um, I mentioned <clears throat> that uh, there's never any minimum amount for any SBA loan. Different programs have different maximums. But uh, SBA recognizes there's a need for smaller loans, a demand. However, there's not really uh, necessarily an appetite or enthusiasm from the banks to entertain those requests. The bank still has to fill out the same forms, follow the same <coughs> underwriting guidelines and policies and procedures. We're just moving zeros and commas and decimal points. So SBA has rolled out our express program to try to uh, address that issue 
and incentivize the lenders to be more receptive to smaller loan requests. Maximum loan amount on this program, only half a million. And uh, so what are some of these incentives to the lender? So um, we've pretty much eliminated, it's nearly paperless, we've pretty much eliminated all SBA paper. No SBA application forms. We allow the lender to use their own internal commercial lending documentation. Whatever's good enough for the bank, it's good enough for SBA. Also, no SBA underwriting or credit analysis. We essentially, I like to say, Paul, we give the bank a rubber stamp to approve and commit our SBA guarantee. So we trust the bank to understand and follow our rules, regulations, and guidelines. Good enough for them, it's good enough for us. The lender would uh, just sign on. We have a secure online portal. They would input some data, transmit that to our national center in Sacramento. They would assign a loan number to the deal, and you're ready to close and get your money from the bank. So the essence of this program regarding the money, the use of the proceeds, much greater flexibility regarding eligible uses of proceeds with this program. It's not strictly, specifically limited to finite, identifiable, short-term export transaction. It could be, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Essentially, we could finance and support any business need that you have as long as we can justify somehow that money is being used for international trade-related endeavors. So that's a very broad brush stroke. So hypothetically, there's some examples there. Working with my friend uh, Erica Ramirez from U.S. Department of Commerce, maybe to support some of their marketing uh, efforts, perhaps through their uh, gold key type program, or any other international trade marketing endeavors to uh, attend a foreign trade show, register for a trade show, buy a booth at some trade show, airfare, hotel expense. Uh, maybe you have some company literature, you want to translate that into a foreign language. Any of those related costs to support your export eff efforts, perfectly eligible. Money could also be used for uh, acquisition of uh, fixed assets, hypothetically only half a million maximum, but could be used, say, for real estate acquisition. If you were going to build a factory or buy a warehouse or other heavy equipment, machinery, computers, trucks, forklifts, a longer term loan to you to facilitate uh, your purchase of those uh, heavy fixed assets that you're going to be using in the day-to-day -day operation of your export business. Uh, last 30 seconds here, Paul. 11.30, right on time. Um, finally, our international trade loan, uh, pro international trade loan program. Uh, this loan uh, designed for, um, this is a fully amortized term loan, up to $5 million maximum, designed for uh, cases where an express loan may not provide enough money to you. Uh, Long-term financing for, <coughs> sorry about that, something uh, haunted here. Uh, Long-term financing, most typical examples say for a real estate loan. So you wanted to build a factory, buy a warehouse, uh, renovate uh, or expand existing facilities. Uh, anything in excess of half a million under the express program, we could potentially support under international trade loan program. Um, and uh, okay, uh, I think that's the nuts and bolts Martin, of it. Oh, please, yeah. Questions. If we have time, please, sure. No, I'm not leaving. Sure. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know a lot of content, but there's some really things that jump right out at me. Um, you have a direct international sale, or you work through a trading company. What is SBA's involvement in that? You have a trading. Co I don't want to export, but I'm going to sell it to the trading company. The trading company is then going to export my product for me. Um, okay, a case like that. Well, uh, that's an indirect export example that you're giving, Paul. So important to hear these. Things. Yeah. Yeah. Because I had a couple slides on that indirect exporting. You know, yeah. So. I'm pulling out these because they're, we're, we're right. streaming to a lot of people too. That's All right. Okay. Good very point. Yes. Information. Got the cameras on. Right. Okay. So yeah. Again, anyone you know, if you're in the in the pipeline, right, in the um, supply chain, we just need to have some clarification, explanation, and evidence of that. We call an indirect exporter. Um, this is perfectly eligible for support under any of these three programs. And um, you know, I mentioned earlier, Paul, one of the first things I said, you know, SBA has, uh, I can't keep track, a dozen, 15 different business loan programs. 
uh, with one of the real key advantages of these three programs, thank you, um, I didn't mention, uh, but if I have time, all three of these programs, we potentially offer up to 90% repayment guarantee to the bank, heaven forbid, in the event that you default on the loan. Our non-export standard vanilla SBA business loans guarantees limited uh, to 75, sometimes as low as only 50%. Uh, but the export loans up a higher guarantee to the lender. That's really more relevant to the lender than it is relevant to you, uh, the applicant. But this is one of the ways where we're trying to um, make the programs more attractive, appealing, and user-friendly to the lenders, give the lenders more incentive to consider uh, using these programs to make the capital more available to you in the first place. So the benefits of these specific programs are? By offering this higher guarantee, more incentive to the lender, and they might be more receptive, hopefully would be more receptive, again, to providing the capital to you that they might not otherwise be willing to afford. Um, and I also, other, also the length of time you're in business, so say 12 months. 12 months, or you know, I will consider any reasonable exception, you know, even less. Really, a startup is going to be real tough for us. You're not immediately ineligible, but if you can bring something to the table, um, as I may gave an example, you know, if you, you've been working for 20 years as an export manager at ABC Company, and now you're going to start your own business, and you've got this... Uh, uh, you know, all this intangible uh, work experience that you bring to the table and you can uh, illustrate that in a, uh, a, a clear, uh, uh, convincing business plan, maybe in partnership with our friends from small business development centers who might be able to help you to compose that. And, and you've got a bank on board that's willing to go to bat for you and maybe you're willing to uh, demonstrate and illustrate your commitment uh, by going above and beyond and offering additional collateral that we might not normally require. There's a lot of give and take and a lot of possibilities here, so nothing's, nothing's impossible. No, it's absolutely um, Like a transforming from a sole, sole proprietorship, but then you're going to be starting an LLC mm -hmm. and you what you're doing before. But the LLC is a new entity, so it doesn't have established business credit. It doesn't have established web right. presence or, you know, okay. for, for Google searches or anything like that. But you have been doing the activity a few years before. Great point. Okay, so um, his question was, if you've been operating a business successfully, say, as a sole proprietorship, successfully for many years, and then for uh, legal or tax advantages, uh, you decide to convert your business structure to an LLC or whatever the case may be, an S Corp or anything else, not a problem, perfectly reasonable, perfectly acceptable, perfectly legitimate, and that past experience certainly by all means would be transferable. We, we wouldn't consider that really as a brand new startup entity. No, those are that's all reasonable um, experience and track record that you'd bring to the table. Certainly we'd need and want to see the financial statements and so forth of uh, the prior entity, but that yeah, wouldn't be a problem, wouldn't be an issue. You're growing and you get a purchase order. You know, your sales market, you get a, you get a purchase order, and they what do I do now, right? Uh, I don't have enough money to fulfill the order. I don't have the money to hire the employees. This is where SPA can come into play, the strength Great. of the purchase order. Man, that's absolutely amazing, because most of you have probably been in that position once or more in your mm. life. So, yes, ma'am, you had a question? I got a question. Do you um, guys refinance the SBA loan? Let's say I have a loan and it's going to be due, but I haven't accomplished what I promised I was going to accomplish on my proposal. And if you refinance them up to how many times can you refinance your SBA? Um, so, gen we, uh, SBA loan, um, is, is generally cannot be refinanced in the future with another SBA loan. If you have a non-SBA loan and you want to refinance that with an SBA loan, that's, that's possibly 
conceivable, yes. For example, you have a traditional commercial bank loan, maybe with a balloon payment coming due. We could potentially consider an SBA application for the purpose of paying off that balloon. Or if you have an existing non-SBA loan on your books, uh, maybe at a very high interest rate or something like that, you want to refinance that with an SBA loan, we can entertain that. But um, we, we really don't, we, we don't refinance an old SBA loan with a new SBA loan. The point being that SBA would never have approved an unreasonable loan to you in the first place. Um, and can you have uh, uh, multiple SBA loans for multiple entities? Uh, Yes, that's not a problem. Um, I'm sorry, just a moment. I'm sorry, did I answer your question? I don't know if I quite understood your, your question. Did I answer your question, though? Kind of. Kind of, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, see me after class. We'll clarify that for you. Okay. And I'm sorry, uh, your question. So there's no $5 million, uh, Paul, is our maximum SBA dollar amount exposure. There's no limit to the number of different loans that you can have, but $5 million <laughs> maximum exposure per Borrower, including any subsidiaries or affiliates that might be involved in that tangled web of ownership. So it's, it's not uncommon at all that we'd have a company that might have uh, two of these export loans for sure. Uh, a company that might have, um, uh, in fact, I'll give you a real life example. I'm way over time here, Paul, sorry, but we had uh, many, some years ago uh, up in LA I had a customer um, that manufactured and exported uh, these children's vitamin supplements, like little kind of candy gummy bears. They weren't candy, though. They were, they were vitamins, right? And this gentleman was of, uh, he was uh, Arab American and um, focused on some real non-traditional markets. We don't see a lot of activity. And he was selling like to uh, Jordan and uh, Lebanon and Egypt. Um, and we helped him with a small export express loan and what he, about $10,000, very small. What he did with that money, he filmed um, a, a cartoon TV commercial for these little gummy bear things in Arabic language, and they broadcast it on the Egyptian children's cartoons in the morning. I remember this. Yeah, and, um, and uh, you know, lo and behold, he started getting some inquiries from uh, distributors in Egypt that wanted to uh, work with him, uh, and the orders, a few orders came in, and then we helped him with a second loan, uh, an export working capital credit line, to support these sales uh, to these Egyptian uh, distributors. So there's a guy that we helped with two loans simultaneously. Yes? Question? Yes, Jen. I have a question. I have a client who does prefab homes. And I want to do it. In Africa, in Kenya, can you borrow the money to build a, um, a building there to do the prefabbing? No, unfortunately, that wouldn't be eligible. No, we can't support any construction in a foreign country. Or You'd have to call the Kenyan SBA. <laughs> Sorry not to make a joke of it, but no, we can't support that kind of endeavor in a foreign Unless it's done country. In a Free trade zone, right? um, no, nevertheless, uh, we just wouldn't be eligible for SBA support. We, support. We, we can't finance the construction of a factory or a facility or something like that right. on foreign soil. So if you're an American company and you're investing in another country, you have a look, you, 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 the business is here, you probably have a factory here, you want to have a subsidiary entity in another country in their free trade zone. That's not allowed? So, um, we and then the product is probably re-exported re back to the U.S. and to other parts of the world. So again, we couldn't finance any construction, construction. or purchase of assets that are going to be on the on foreign soil. Um, if if you're looking to expand your efforts internationally and you want you need just some working capital, not, not for real estate construction, not for acquisition of assets or collateral, but you want to expand your business internationally, maybe hire some new employees or sales or marketing staff, and they're going to be working overseas in a foreign office that you're operating. We may have some flexibility in that regard. 
but um, new no, not for new construction or fixed assets or things like that on a, on foreign soil. That, regretfully, not not eligible. Well, there's a lot of pro a lot of things. I love examples because you know when you sit here, whether you're brand new or you've been in business, and the examples tell the story. Mm. We've had some amazing success stories with these programs. So I think the message is that the SBA loan guarantee programs for international trade are vibrant. They give the banks more protection, and they allow you to keep more money in your pocket, and allow you to extend yourself to build your business. Can you agree? Uh, I think that sums it up, Paul, and I'm way over time, way over time here. So, and there's, uh, thanks. Uh, there's the most important information is my phone number, and I'll leave some, some of these Hollywood brochures. Nice to be here. I want to thank um, Paul Smith and Veselina Farouk for inviting me. And I also want to just pick up on the last question since it seemed to center on uh, construction in another country involving American materials, probably American know-how, and but they need financing in the other country. I'm not going to say that Exim Bank will finance that. But I, but I can tell you what I know XM Bank has done before. They have financed the construction of new airports in another country. They have financed the construction of power plants. They have financed the construction of hospitals. And I can tell you what the US uh, uh, DFI, Develop uh, International uh, Development Finance Corporation. What is it called? That what OPIC used to be, U.S. International Development Finance Corporation. Uh, yeah, U.S. International DFC. Used to be OPIC, Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And I can tell you that they have financed uh, housing construction in other countries, and they and they do it. OPIC does it if there is an aspect of the project that is going to elevate the well-being of the people in that country. That's part of their charter. That's not part of the XM charter. XM charter, they, they, it's not that they're cold-blooded or anything. They, they like to help people too, but it's not in the charter. It, the, what's in the charter of XM Bank is to take foreign risk for American exporters so that they win against exporters from other countries. Okay, so there's quite a nuance of, differ of difference there. Um, so would they finance construction of manufactured homes? I don't know. I can tell you that bankers tend to not be real comfortable with manufactured homes because of their relative weakness structurally compared with other kinds of homes. And a banker wants to finance something if he finances the construction of it, that's going to be there for a long time. So I, I, it's just a side comment of mine. OK, so um, we're going to talk about means of payment in international trade transactions. So if, if you're involved in international trade transactions, I, I hardly recommend right now that you, you know, as soon as you get out of here, go back and get a Google search on Inco terms and memorize them. 
understand what they mean. Does everybody here know what an INCO terms are? Okay, I-N-C-O, what does that stand for, INCO? I don't know what it stands for. INCO terms, everybody uses the term, I-N-C-O, T-E-R-M-S. Does everybody here know what the, have you heard the term FOB? Yeah. FOB Los Angeles, that's an INCO term. And it means free on board. Free on board what? A vessel, obviously. And so uh, there's, a, there, there's a general misconception among the public, among bankers, among insurers, among everybody in the world who doesn't read these things and memorize them. There's a general misconception that INCO terms defines when ownership changes from the seller to the buyer. And they have nothing to do with ownership. The only thing that has anything to, own, to do with ownership uh, of an amount of goods is the ownership document for the amount of goods. So if they're being shipped somewhere, the bill of lading is an ownership document. The bill of lading says to the person who you know, hires the ship to carry the goods, uh, I've got your goods, but you own them. Okay, they may be halfway between here and Japan, but you still own them because uh, you've got the bill of lading, okay? And when does that change? Well, the bill of lading can be negotiable. So somebody who has a bill of lading can endorse it on the back and just like a check and turn it over to somebody else. And that's, that's how ownership does change in international trade transactions. And so let's see, why did I start on that? Because... Um, because, because you need to know when you're negotiating exports, you need to know who's paying for what. You know what the goods cost, that's your business. You know what a price is that's gonna make you a profit, that's also your business. But do you know if that price will also pay for you to ship it to Long Beach, have it loaded on a, on a vessel, take it to Korea, have it unloaded, have the duty paid, have it trucked over to your customer, do you know those things? You might not, okay? That's where INCO terms are very important. You need to know when you're negotiating the sale, what does the, at what point is that price valid? If you can sell your goods for $50,000 and make your profit, X works, that means you make them, you crate them, and you put them on your dock, X works my factory, that's where your profit is, that's fine. That's, that's where you, you, you make money. But if the buyer has asked for delivered duty paid, he wants a price that includes not just you know, your ex works price, but all the costs of getting the goods to his location. And there, there are things in between. There's free on board. Get it just loaded on the vessel and I'll take care of it. Why would they do that? Why would the buyer say, I want an FOB price, Long Beach? Because the buyer may be a huge importer or you know, ne negotiator of a lot of transactions. <clears throat> he might have a special, special cargo freight. He doesn't want you touching the cargo rates on that. He might have special conditions with the carrier. So he just says, I want your price FOB, this vessel Long Beach. Excuse me. <clears throat> so the thing is, you really need to know, it takes, you, it takes you 20 minutes to learn the different ones. The second thing that you really, really should know are the different terms, the uh, different means of payment. And we've talked a little bit about them. So I'm gonna try to be very, very clear and, um, and speak about these. <clears throat> Let's see, and speak about these in very clear terms. Okay, that's the pointy end, gotcha. Okay. Okay, thanks, Vesla. There we go. This is thanks to the U.S. Department of Commerce because they put this on their website. And, you know, this, if I'm boring you, I apologize if you, if you already know this. The most secure terms of payment for the exporter is cash in advance. He risks nothing. He gets all the cash up front, and then he ships his goods. Second to that would be letters of credit, where the buyer sends a letter of credit from his banker. And we'll go into a little bit about letters of credit. But the letter of credit is basically a letter that says to a seller, 
names that seller the beneficiary. It says in between the lines was what it says is you don't know this buyer. So you probably are afraid to send your goods without getting cash up front. And he doesn't want to pay cash up front. But I know the buyer because I'm his banker. So I'm opening this letter of credit in your favor as the beneficiary. And um, if you will prepare the goods for shipment, get them shipped, and get that ownership document, that bill of lading, and bring it with some other documents I need to a bank in your country who's my correspondent bank, I'll pay you. That's what that bank is saying with the letter of credit. Okay, And so it's very, very secure. And uh, unless you think the bank is, is going to fold, but banks don't fold that often. They just don't. Um, so it's very secure. The next most secure means is documentary collection for the exporter. And a documentary collection is really the same as a letter of credit, except there is no letter of credit. It's a sort of a hopeful thing where you take your documents of, of, of ownership down to your bank and your bank forwards them to the buyer's bank and says, please collect what is owed to, to this, this exporter, and then we'll turn the documents over to you. And that's a documentary collection. And then there's finally open account, which is the, no offense to any religions, I happen to be a Catholic anyway, it's the Hail Mary of, you know, of international trade. You know, you send the goods out there. You had a great meal with these people, had a few laughs and some alcohol probably or whatever. And you send those goods off and you just hope they pay you. Send them an invoice too, by the way. You owe me this $50,000. Hope, hope you pay. And that's an, that's an open account invoice. We won't finance that at GBC Bank. You need to get that open account invoice insured with Exim Bank or with the private sector Euler, Hermes, Kofas, one of those, before you bring it to us to finance. Uh, but there are times when uh, open, account, open account invoicing makes sense. For example, when your customer, you really want to sell to them, it's the Taiwan, uh, manuf uh, what is it? Uh, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Association, or a Manufacturing Corporation in Taipei, Taiwan. And they're huge. They, they manufacture billions of, of, of uh, semiconductors, and you happen to provide them with spare parts or equipment that they need. And you're based over here in California, and you want to sell to them because that's good for your business. And they say, if you want to sell to me, you can sell to me on any terms that you want, but I'll pay you 60 days after I see the goods. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? And they're driving, they're driving the sale because they're big. They know they're big, and you, you want that business. So they're going to pay you 60 days after the goods arrive in Taiwan. So that would be, that would be a, a good reason to be selling on open account because if you don't, you won't get the sale. And you could even ask us, and we probably would, to waive the insurance requirement because, it, again, it depends on the buyer. If, if, if the buyer... Uh, if the buyer is strong enough, we might waive the insurance requirement. And then the, the, you know, the, the least, I mean, the most risky thing for the exporter is to send goods and never even ask for, for money because they're on consignment. Because you believe that this distributor or dealer in equipment can sell these goods. But they've said, I need some samples and not samples really, but I, I need, I need to stock a variety of sizes of your machines. All machines, you name it, air compressors, they come in sizes. So, you know, it starts with the small one, the middle, and the big one. You know, and, and the, the dealer might say, I need all, I need two of each size. And I need them on consignment, I, I can't pay you now. If you want the sale bad enough, if you want that relationship bad enough in that country, and you see the potential you know, for additional sales in that country, which no doubt you've learned by going to the Department of Commerce and asking for the country studies, asking to, you know, to in, educate yourself on, the, on the, that country, then you might do, you might do a consignment sale. So anyway, for the importer, it's the exact reverse. You can, you, that makes sense. I mean, you know, if the importer has to send, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many exporters have said to me, well, <clears throat> we sell 
prepaid terms only, prepaid cash. And, you know, they're proud of that, which I think is it's a reverse pride because it's, it's like saying they're proud of it because they don't really know. They don't know anything about these people overseas and they're not willing to go there and learn anything about the people overseas, but they'll sure take their money. You see what I'm saying? And they say it with pride, but I, it just being an old international banker kind of guy, I just say, you know, it just doesn't sit well with me. But anyway, but 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 that's that's the fact. Those are the facts. But then I would always ask them too. Well, how can you really grow your business? I mean, that way. I mean, have, you know, or have you lost great sales opportunity because the buyers wouldn't send cash in advance. They wanted some negotiated term like the ones we've been talking about. So um, that's just uh, that's just what it is. Uh, cash in advance is the least. It's the least safe for the buyer. And, you know, and a lot of a lot of countries, the cultures are such very strong top down cultures. And you're dealing with a buyer and he's reporting up the line to the owners or it could even be a government owned company or something like that. And this buyer is here. How much risk is he really going to take with you? You know, is he going to risk his job and his family income uh, because he he sends you cash in advance before he even sees the goods? There's a lot of cultures out there that they're not going to do that. They want to see the goods, at least have the goods in the country before before sending any any money to you. So anyway, so that's uh, those are the means of payment. So letters of credit. A lot of people think they're dead and, you know, and they don't like them and they're problematic. But sometimes it's really the only way, the only way to do things. Because, you know, my friends from Exim Bank, <clears throat> my friends from Exim Bank will say, well, you can always insure, have, have it open invoicing and, and insuring it. But, um, you know, letter of credit also protects the buyer because the bank has to check through all the documentation that it was packed correctly, insured correctly, and all that sort of thing before they pay, and some buyers like that. And you don't get that with open invoicing. So uh, it's, it, it, it does well to understand. You, there's, you hear a lot of people, they, they, they don't like letters of credit, but uh, they don't really understand them either. And so it's better just to first understand it, then decide if you like or don't like what you understand. You know what I'm saying? So you have an issuing bank here, which I, I did just go through that, substituting its name for the buyer and protecting the seller. And then you have an advising bank, which is basically a messenger service because that issuing bank might not have a branch in this country. If they do, they'll probably send it to their branch. But even then, the branch not, might not be in the same city, so they go through an advising bank. And then there's... <clears throat> That advising bank might also become a confirming bank because the advising bank, uh, <laughs> they might play on the lack of knowledge of the issuing, about the issuing bank. I saw this happen. A, a bank out of uh, the country of Kenya was issuing letters of credit and neither the exporter nor the banker was comfortable with the export, the importer's bank was comfortable with the name or the exporter's bank was comfortable with the name of this of this bank. They just they just, you know, and so they wanted a confirmation. They wanted a confirmation. And and so what this advising bank does is it's it's got to know who the issuing bank is. And they have a line of credit internally for that issuing bank that says we will confirm up to five million, a million, whatever they're comfortable with in letters of credit issued by that bank. And so then when the letter of credit comes in, they not only advise the client, but they add their confirmation. Now you will pay for that. I'll, I'll show you what you pay for it. And they add their, and when they add their confirmation, then you go to sleep at night saying to yourself, I just shipped my goods or I'm about to, and um, I didn't get cash in advance, but I have um, a letter of credit from this bank in a country that I can't even pronounce the name of. However, my local bank, Wells Fargo, or GBC, has confirmed it. So really, my, my money 
my money is guarded or is, you know, is, has the confirmation of, of my local bank. So that's, that's the confirmation. Okay. So, <clears throat> I'm sorry? The advising bank can be the same as the confirming bank. The what? The advising bank? Yes. It can be. It can be. The, the and the bank will tell you that. When they advise you of the, of the existence of a letter of credit, they, because the letter of credit, it might be mailed to you in old-fashioned you know, paper form, but like as not, it won't be. It'll, it'll be transmitted by a uh, message, you know, coded SWIFT message from the issuing bank to uh, you via a bank that you have already told your customer that you work with. So when would they be different, the confirming? Well, uh, they would be different if the advising bank just advises you that I have a letter of credit naming you as the beneficiary from the XYZ Bank of uh, you know France, and <clears throat> and. Parent bank of the subsidiary in your city, or, or uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm I'm not following that. So, would that where would this bank be coming? Would would, would that be a government agency, uh, Exim Bank, or or? Well, Exim Bank is not involved there. <clears throat> So you have, let's say that you're selling some goods to a company in France, and uh, you've negotiated, you've said, I'll, I'll do this, I want a letter of credit. So Banque Nationale de Paris opens up a letter of credit naming your company as a beneficiary. What do they do with that letter of credit? They might send it to you. They might just, they might just mail it to you, and now it's in the mail. Or they might send it to me at GBC Bank. And they, might, and they might send it by swift message, and they might say, please advise this letter of credit to your company. Then I call you up or whatever, and I advise you that there's a letter of credit for your company, and I have it. I've got it. I've, I've have it, and I'm going to be able to negotiate it for you. You know, turn it into cash is what negotiate means. And so, and so... Um, that message that I get from Banque Nationale de Paris might also say, please add your confirmation and advise the beneficiary. Now, why would they do that? Probably because their customer said, uh, this guy, he doesn't know who we are, and he's, and he's very doubtful, and, and, but I need his goods, so, so have your correspondent bank in the U.S. confirm it for him all confirmation charges for account of buyer and the buyer saying I'll pay that. So you see what I mean? You're going to get a message. You're going to get a phone call or I'm sorry? So the messenger bank is pretty much a bigger more established bank giving credibility to the, the smaller the, bank in the The messenger bank could be any bank. Any bank that has a relationship, a business relationship with the issuing bank. Right. Or even you know has a relationship with another bank who has that relationship because sometimes they go through intermediaries, which is not fun. Yes, sir. Uh, just out of curiosity, um, when you're opening a line of credit or your customer is opening a line of credit or LLC, um, is it more beneficial to open it in the place you're doing business or the country you're doing business for legality reasons? <coughs> yeah. Not really. I mean, I mean, it's up to the, the the buyer is who has to open the letter of credit. He's going to open that letter of credit, which with whatever bank uh, will do that for him. And it's going to be, have to be a bank that knows his business, maybe finances the business, and is very comfortable opening a letter of credit for him. And it doesn't matter if the buyer's in France, but his bank is London is in London. That's okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. So. <clears throat> now, one thing about letters of credit, I, I, I get calls from exporters and they say, I've got a letter of credit and I need to borrow money. And here you go, pal, you, you banker, you're going to have the collateral of this letter of credit. So you should loan me money right away because I only need 50% of the amount of that letter of credit to do what I need to do, buy goods or make goods and stuff. And so you should be able to lend me that money. Ladies and gentlemen, a letter of credit is not collateral, at least in this country and in our de banking definitions. Maybe in India, maybe in Brazil, 
maybe in Lebanon where they're really sharp about foreign trade and they really get it and they really understand the risk and they only lend on the risks, you won't get that from American bankers. I sometimes think that American bankers don't even understand risks in international trade. But one thing they do understand is their rules of making loans. And the, because that's what they're going to show to the regulators when the regulators come through. And the rules of making loans say that thou shalt not make a loan to a company without three years of financial statements that you've analyzed and determined that it's a going concern that is turning its receivables and its inventory in a normal way, generating a cash flow. And if there are any exceptions to those, to those healthy signs that you have analyzed those exceptions and you have stated in your credit file that it's okay and this is why, and in other words, you really, really know your customer, okay? That's the only time that you're gonna get pre-shipment financing, that's what it is, against that letter of credit. Other, other, other exporters say, you don't have to worry about this letter of credit because I'm going to assign the proceeds to you. That's a mistake right there. It's a misnomer right there because the beneficiary of a letter of credit cannot assign the proceeds. Only the issuer of the letter of credit can assign those proceeds. So if he really says he's going to assign the proceeds, you, you know, the, 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 that is the, buy, the, the exporter, that means he has to go back to the buyer and he says to the buyer, go to your bank and have them assign the proceeds. And we have a form that we can give you that that bank will have to sign to assign those proceeds to us, okay? So, so it's not so easy assigning proceeds as, as people would like you to think when you're a banker. And let's say that even you can get the assignment of proceeds from, from your buyer through his bank to us, and now the proceeds are assigned to me, I still have a risk that I, that I have to know about, and that is performance risk. Wait a minute. I, whoop. Where is it? Performance risk. Okay? Even if you assign those proceeds or your banker assigns those proceeds, if I don't know you, you know, I get these calls and I, I don't know the company. It's, you know, how do you do? This is my company. This is what I do. I have a letter of credit from Standard Bank of South Africa. And I need to borrow money, so come on, banker, what, show me what you can do. Well, you know, I don't know what the performance risk is because that letter of credit, see, collateral, and, and people think this is collateral, but it's not collateral. You know what collateral is? Collateral is what you liquidate to cash as a banker when your buyer says, sorry, I'm winding up the business. It ain't going to work. I'm going, I'm going bankrupt. So then I go, okay, well, I better liquidate my collateral. What have I got? I've got his accounts receivable. That'll turn to cash. I've got his factory machinery and cars. That'll turn to cash. Oh, and I have this letter of credit. Hmm, what's that worth? It's not worth jack, and you know the next word. It's, yeah. not, <laughs> it's not worth jack until he's shipped. And that's the performance risk that you have to take, that you have to take as a, as a banker. Okay. Um, not to say you shouldn't be proud of having a letter of credit. You should be, because, because uh, it means that your buyer is, is, is a substantial company in that country, substantial enough to gain the credit of a bank there that's risking their, risking their money, saying, you know, issuing a letter of credit for that, for that buyer. And so then what you do is you call your banker and say, look, I'm, I'm you know, involved in international trade. I'm getting letters of credit from several countries in Asia. And, you know, I'd like to, these letters of credit, you know, require that I, you know, that there's a 60 or 90 day period of time before the bank actually pays. But I need finance. So I'd like, I'd like to get to know you as a banker and let's talk about it. And uh, I want to show you what my company does so that you can evaluate me as an exporter. And, and maybe I love a call like that. That's, that's, that's what we do. Okay. <clears throat> Documentary collection, yeah, I think I said, is the same as a letter of credit, but there's no, there's, there's, no, uh, there's no undertaking of the bank. You know, in the letter of credit, the bank is saying, 
if you show me these documents, you get cash with these documents, or you get a you get a time draft. I mean, you know, you know, I accept to pay the draft in 60 days or something like that. Um, <clears throat> Well, you know, this is what I like to, to, to remember is that, you know, when you do a documentary collection, because probably your buyer doesn't want to pay for a letter of credit, it's expensive. And so, so just sit, do it on a documentary collection. When you do a documentary collection, you really are trusting the banks involved. You take it to your bank, they forward it to their bank, or maybe you forward it direct to the bank. And, you know, the documents are hanging out there, including probably a negotiable bill of lading, which is title to your goods. And so, you know, it's a little looser than, it's a little looser. But many, many exporters have very, very trustworthy agents in those countries that they export to that can, that can handle these things. That's a question I always ask is on documentary collections, who's your agent? How long have you worked with them? How many, how many shipments have you sent through him? Has he handled the paperwork right? Has he gotten you paid when you're supposed to be paid? That's, those are the questions I want to know about an agent. Okay. Um, well, I, I was going to get into financing, but I don't think we have the time. Um, just basically, letters of credit, people like to talk about irrevocable site letters of credit. That's great. Site means that the credit will be paid, made cash, upon sight of shipping documents and an export, excuse me, and a draft drawn by the exporter on the buyer at sight. Okay, that's a site, that's a site credit, site payment. That draft can also be drawn for a, a specific date in the future, or it can be drawn for payment 30, 60, 90 days at, from site. So that what that's doing is it's putting a financing term into the instrument. And that's what usually the exporter does is an accommodation to the buyer. So the buyer doesn't have to pay because his bank won't pay. His bank won't pay until 60 days from site of the shipping documents. And, and this what's called now it's called it's not a site draft anymore. It's a time draft. It's a 60 day time draft to be paid 60 days hence. And the, the letter of credit is no longer called a site letter of credit. It's called a usance letter of credit, which is an old term from Lord knows how many centuries ago, but they still use it because what are you doing? You're using the letter of credit, not only as a means of payment, but as a financing tool because the exporter is pretty happy with the risk that the bank, the issuing bank, is, you know, is putting an accepted acceptance on the time draft, saying, yeah, we'll pay this in 60 days. We're not going to pay it now, but if the documents are, are good, we'll start the clock and we'll pay it in 60 days. That makes me as the exporter sleep okay at night, and I, because, but, but that letter of credit has been used to finance, you know, so I just would urge you as an exporter, is when you quote your pricing, always quote it, of course, at, you know, at, um, at site, I mean, or, 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 F, or X doc your works, whatever. In other words, if, if any kind of financing creeps in, either the buyer asks for commercial terms, 60, 90 days on an invoicing basis, or they say, I, I'll open a usance letter of credit and you need to draw drafts on me at 90 days site. Well, now you're financing this guy. So there should be a different price. There should be a different price for the goods because $100,000 today is $100,000 today. But in three months, is it still $100, $100,000? And it depends on inflation. It depends on your cost of capital. Maybe it's 97000 And so why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just say, sure, it's 100000 a day, but if you know if you need 90 day terms, 102,622, you know, because that's going to pay for your cost of finance. Because what if you have to finance your business during that time? I can tell you what it'll cost you. You can put that number in. And and what if it's not a letter of credit? It's open invoicing, 90 days terms, and you need to buy insurance on that. Uh, XM will tell you how much that'll cost. You can put those numbers 
on a piece of paper and then say, you know, this is my price, 100000 today if, you know, uh, when, when I ship. But if it's three months, it's a different price. Okay. Um, these are the fees, and you can't see them from there, but these are the fees for all that stuff, advising, confirming, discounting, drafts, and things like that. And then uh, open account, yeah, we talked about. <clears throat> we can finance, you know, any of these means of payment. It all depends on the details, and, and we get into the details when we, when we speak with you. And, um, and we can work with all of the programs that the government presented today, the three SBA uh, guarantees. We probably have 40 loans on the books right now that are uh, guaranteed by the Export Express Program, the International Trade Loan Program, or the um, Export Working Capital Guarantee from SBA. And then we have another 20 loans on the books that are guaranteed by Exim Bank. Why do we use SBA versus Exim? It doesn't really matter. I mean, real, I, I mean, I can tell you why when we get into an individual transaction, but I, but I don't want to, you know, you know, you know, use your time now to talk about the nuances and the differences between SBA and Exim. You don't really care as long as you get the financing you need to do the business you want to. And when you've got a transaction, we can go into the different uh, nuances and the costs and the, and the fees and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, bid and performance bonds, they are, I'm sure Martin noted this, that they can be issued um, by your banker if the banker is getting the SBA guarantee on, in one of their programs or if he's getting the XM Bank guarantee in their working capital guarantee program. And um, <clears throat> hedging foreign currencies. I don't, I, I, I don't If you have any questions about that, give me a call and we can talk it over. But basically, <laughs> some transactions, I've seen a few, are denominated in euros because the buyers just, you know, I guess are strong enough that they don't want to deal in dollars, they want to deal in euros. So the exporter here says, I want this business, so I'm going to take, I'm going to sign the contract. I'm going to get euros. Now what do I do? I've got these euros. Well, you, you know, you've got to exchange them for dollars because you work in dollars here. And so then that, that begs the question, at what rate? Well, you can lock a rate with a forward contract. You can also, you, you can not lock a rate, but you can get an option to, um, you know, to, for, for a future rate of exchange where you either take it or don't take it depending on how the market's moving. And your banker can, can talk you through all of that stuff. <clears throat> the, suffice it to say, there's no need to be taking, there's no need to be taking foreign exchange risk in your business. You can hedge it with banks. And, and, and before you decide to hedge or not, get them to tell you what it's going to cost. Because there might be minimum sizes, too, of amounts. They might not hedge $10,000, but they might hedge $25,000. Yes, sir? About cryptocurrencies, like they're paying you by Bitcoin or anything like that. Who, what kind of brokers? Cryptocurrency. Like oh, cryptocurrency. Like cryptocurrency. Bitcoin. Good question. I don't know. I, I I've only read of one transaction that was done in cryptocurrency. It was a it was a very large uh, public utility or something built in Egypt, and I think it was done by cryptocurrencies. But your day to day banker like me, we're not we're not going anywhere near them. We just, we don't get them, and we don't understand it, it's unregulated. Fiat currency is what we like because that's issued by a nation. And that's safe and it's understandable and it's hopefully predictable. Nations don't change that often, they do, but not that. But cryptocurrency, we just haven't figured out yet. Thank you. Okay, and then these are just some folks. I'm Dave Josephson, Edward Tang works with me. I'll have to put Harold Wong on this slide because he now works with us in business development for international. And then Jonathan Chu is our letter of credit exporter, uh, expert. And we love to have your calls because we love to talk about this stuff. It's always interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Okay. I'll tell you, there is one session I don't learn something new from you when you come on. And I think yeah. when you're in business, you want to have, you want to surround yourself with a team of really talented people that can be your expert supporters. It goes back to uh, 
I, Angel, will comment about the outreach team. We have and can facilitate that for you going forward. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention, if you haven't noticed by now, every session we really have been taking a deep dive in each of these categories. And the goal is not for you to remember everything, but to really start thinking about what you don't know so we can help you go into more. And the next session I would like to share with you, first I'd like to thank all of our speakers for the day. They really are some of the best that you're going to find. Um, the next session is actually very critical for those of you that have been in business for a long time, domestic or international. We're going to talk about contracts, domestic versus international contracts, how important they are, distributor agreements, agency agreements, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, just all the things you must know before you go forward with these clients. We're going to talk about foreign trade zones, and we're going to talk about logistics and get into all those shipping terms and who takes title and that type of thing. And we're also going to be getting involved with immigration law and hiring of foreign employees. So I'd like to thank you all for your time today, and I hope to see you next week. Thank you.